minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. You are now tapped into the coolest reptile podcast in the world. I'm your boy, MJ. What is good, everybody? Welcome to the Trap Talk podcast. If this is your first time tapping in. What is good? Do your boy a favor. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. That way you're on top of every single podcast I drop here on this YouTube channel. I drop over four podcasts a week. Nobody's doing that in the game, okay? So you're in the right place. It's all reptile related. If you're in the reptile game, keeping or breeding or just for the love of looking at you're in the right place, man. So hit that subscribe button. And then more importantly, I want to know what your thoughts are on each episode. Drop me a comment, not in the live chats, which shout out to all the early birds. I see you guys. I'll get to you guys in a second. But drop me a comment. Let me know what you guys like best out of each episode. I do pay attention to all that. Um, I do want to say if you would like to support this more than a subscription, more than a, a view, a couple ways you could do about a uh, couple ways you could go about that, right? First off, if you have an important question for our man, our guest, Steve Volk tonight, something that you really want to ask and you want to make sure I ask it, drop a super chat. If you're in the live chat, see that dollar sign? Drop a super chat. I don't care if it's a dollar. Any super chat, I will go ahead and put onto the big screen and I'll ask that question. Other than that, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, shout out to my Patreon members. If you're looking for some exclusive content, if you want behind the scenes, if you want to get tapped into the Trap Talk family discord, Best thing you should do is go down to the link in the description, the very top link, join the Trap Talk Patreon family. As soon as you join the Patreon family, you get the link to the Discord and it taps you in with over 130 Trap Talk family members. Oh my God, we're growing. I'm not worthy. You want to know something crazy? We have a new family member, a new Trap Talk family member who I'm going to go ahead and shout out right now because if it's one thing uh, this family member went ahead and did for me is he went ahead and facilitated this podcast, I don't know if it was because of the amazing time we had at Tinley. I don't know. But Gary Shavino, a part of the Trap Talk Patreon family. Can you believe it? Anyways, I want to say, Gary, thank you for becoming a Patreon member. But more importantly, thank you for facilitating this podcast. I am so excited for this. And uh, yes, guys, if you do not follow Gary Shavino and you're into the snake keeping game, you are really missing out. I'm not just saying that because he's my friend. I'm talking about knowledge stuff that you could really take back and really have for you in your back pocket or in, I guess, in your library on YouTube in case you ever need to go to it. This man's helped me with prolapses, uh, like snake prolapses, of course. Uh, but you know, other many things, this guy's, he's one of my favorite YouTube YouTubers in the game by, by far. I'm, I mean, this is before we became friends. So I want to say, please head over to YouTube, Gary Shavino, GS reptiles on YouTube and go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Go follow on Instagram. This guy is one of the best in the game, hands down. He hasn't even been on my show yet. That's how amazing he is. But that's going to change, right, Gary? Um, I got to say thank you so much, Gary Shavino. I want to say shout out to Marshall Mendez, Bill Stiegel. Man, what a legend. What a legendary crew to be showing up to Tinley with, right? I was hanging out with those guys all weekend um, and just everything elevated. I got to tell you, this is why I always recommend you going to uh, a show, right? More importantly, at Tinley. If you're in this for the long run like I am and you've never been to a Tinley, I mean, yeah, I get that Tinley will be even better because you haven't gone. But seriously, stop wasting time. Just get your butt to an NARBC. Get your butt to a Reptile Super Show. I guess I'll say shout out to the sponsor. Shout out to the Reptile Super Show. Uh, shout out to Robin, too. I like Robin. But we're going to do this for this episode. On this episode, the sponsor is Reptile Super Show. Shout out to Rami, the sickest, funnest show on the West Coast. And then, of course, if you want to talk about making moves, meeting somebody you never thought you'd meet, that's the NARBCs, okay? The Reptile Super Shows, excuse me, the Reptile, the Super Bowl of Super Shows, uh, the Super Bowl of Reptile Shows, get it together, MJ, is the NARBCs. Tinley's a good example of that, and I had one of the best times I've ever had at any Reptile Show at an NARBC. So Brian Potter, okay, Bob Ashley, thank you so much for everything that you do. Rami, thank you for everything that you do, bringing us all together and just helping us grow. That's what it's all about. I want to say shout out to US Art too. If you are a US Art member, I appreciate you. But more importantly, shout out to anyone who went to the US Art auction at Tinley. We raised over $141,000. Crazy. 
I love it. You know, I'm telling you right now, this is what it's all about. If you're into animals, you should be into US Arc, plain and simple. So shout out to any US Arc member out there. Shout out to any US Arc supporter. Head over to YouTube. Go become a US Arc subscriber. That way you're on top of every single piece of current event. Never know when stuff's going to happen in your area. So just be on top of it, please. Best way you can do about that is just simply subscribing to US Arc on YouTube. Shout out to Phil Goss. Shout out to the entire US Arc family. Vanessa, what a girl. Whew, she had a good time at Tinley. If you're around, you know. Uh, <laughs> man, oh gosh. I got to say also, guys, make sure you guys go follow me on my other YouTube channels. Um, I have a vlog I come out with every single week. It's called The Snake Trap Vlogs. Make sure you head over to uh, my YouTube channel, The Trap Vlogs. Okay, it's still under the Snake Trap Sessions, I believe. I don't know why, but anyways, just go to the, the, the Snake Trap Vlogs. Go subscribe because I do randomly go to uh, uh, one of my guests' place and I do a vlog on their whole collection. And then I also give you guys an update on my own personal collection, okay? So more importantly, if you want to see what people are working with, but then also what I'm working with other than podcast stuff, this is what you want to go subscribe to because I'm going to be very active. I'm dropping one vlog a week, but I'm going to be bumping it up to two vlogs a week. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to save up some ammunition as far as content goes. And I'm going to be able to start pumping out two vlogs a week here pretty soon. So head over to my YouTube channel, The Snake Trap Vlogs, and go subscribe. And then also, if you want to catch all my past guests, if you want to catch really important topics, conversations that I've had with people on the show, you're definitely going to want to head over to the Trap Talk Clips and go subscribe to this Trap Talk Clips. And that way you could catch really cool pieces of episodes that I've had with nothing but legendary people on this show, okay? Um, speaking of legendary people... <laughs> What's up with my early birds? Who's here in the building? I know there's people excited, man. I've gotten hit up by people I never even heard of. Uh, I think I think people literally created a Facebook just to message me to say, "Wow, you got Steve Volk on." I'm dead serious. This is crazy. So it's gonna go down. Who's ready? My boy Mike, 1776 Exotics. Mike, I hope you're gonna get into the Emerald game after this. My boy is no joke. He's messing with some awesome chondros. Really no like really heavy ball python projects, but I want this guy to keep emeralds, and he's in the right episode for that. So I hope this goes down. Focus Cube Habitat, show it to the sponsor. What you guys see behind me, all Focus Cube Habitats. And my sponsor is right there, Stephen and Ashley. Oh, by the way, I want to say tomorrow my vlog drops. I was just talking about, you know, make sure you go and, um, you know, follow my YouTube channel, uh, The Trap Vlogs. Well, guess what? Tomorrow I have a vlog dropping um, for my visit over at Bill Stiegel. Okay, so make sure you head over uh, and set your reminder for this episode because not only do we get some amazing Chondro updates on Bill Stiegel's Chondro's productions from this year, but he has some amazing prototype enclosures that Focus Cube Habitats drop. I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty jealous about this uh, because, you know, yeah, whatever. I don't want to get into it. But he's a mayor of Condor Town. I understand. Okay, guys, you don't want to miss this episode. It's going to be amazing. It shows you what's to come with Focus Cube Habitats. They are the future, man. Nobody's messing with Focus Cube Habitats. It's the truth. I'm telling you right now. So make sure you guys head over to that uh, YouTube channel. Set your reminders because it's going to be an amazing show. 7.45 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Thank you to the sponsor, Nassar. What is good? Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. By the way, Big Mike, Trap Talk Patreon member, OG, triple OG. I oh, want Patreon members. What's up, Ricky Bobby? No, me, Shane in the building. Trap Talk Patreon member, man. He's actually one of my, he's on my mentorship, man. He's on my mentorship Patreon tier. Um, and I'm looking to working with you, Shane. Man, to the top we go. I cannot wait. Thank you to my boy, Shane. Appreciate your support, bro. Jason, what is up, Jason? Thanks for tapping in. Lucas, my boy, Trap Talk Patreon Savage right here. Okay, this little gangster is going to be going big in this game. It was happy to see you and the family over the weekend, bro. I uh, appreciate you so much. But, guys, go give him a follow. Lucas, Cobra Keeper Jr., the future of the hobby right there. Eric's More Factory, what is good? Thanks for tapping in. Bods Exotics, what's up, Jeremy? Thanks for tapping in. Had a great time with him. We actually took a shot at 10 in the morning uh, Saturday at Tinley. What a time. Shout out to Steve Morphs as well. Wise guys, forget about it. Thanks for tapping in. Look at, look at this. My right-hand guy right here, Serpent Eclipse. Guys, I got to say, shout out to my new logo. A lot of you guys loved my new logo. I got hella props all Weekend at Tinley, okay? Unfortunately, I didn't bring shirts for everyone. But guess what? I am now taking uh, pre-sale orders, okay? If you are trying to get your hands on one of these brand new Trap Talk logo shirts, okay? Because this is only going to be one wave of these. Make sure you hit me up, okay? I'm going to be shipping out, I think, about 20 of these tomorrow. Um, and I have about 20 left to get rid of, okay? But then I'm going to order a whole other round. So, you know, a lot of these only go to my Patreon members and they only go to guests I've had on. But I'm letting you guys know right now, if you're watching this, you're like, yo, I want to get one of those shirts. Hit me up. Hit me up on Instagram. Email me, the snake trap sessions uh, at gmail.com. Let me know. Okay. And, and I got you. Hit me up and we'll talk. Okay. 
appreciate the support. But yeah, that's my boy right there, Adler. He's helped me with my logo. Big things in the work with my boy right here. Go give him a follow. Serpent Eclipse Reptiles. PCF Funny Royals. What is good? Oh, by the way, and he's a Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Aurelio Cir Circusis. I hope I said that right. Thanks for being here, buddy. Wilcox Reptiles. Had another good time with this homie right here. Tinley, thanks for tapping in. Julio Fulio, what is up? Trap Talk Patreon member, what's good? Blacklist Exotics. What's up, homegirl? Thanks for tapping in. Lindsay, what is up? Thanks for tapping in. Had a good time at Tinley. Got to meet Lindsay and her amazing German Shepherds. It was an amazing time. Slithery Serpents, what is good? Thanks for tapping in. Ballistic Pythons, what is good? Thanks for tapping in. Jesse Morgan, what is good? Thanks for tapping in. Dan Bands, Bows, my bad. I must, must say that. Thanks for tapping in. Sound Serpents, Sean Perry. Trap Talk Patreon member, thanks for tapping in. Ooh, look who we got. Big timer. Keith Flax in the building. That's my boy, Keith Flax. Pat him on Trap Talk. This guy knows what he's doing, man. That's my boy, Keith. Keith, I hope you have a great season this coming up. And uh, you had a great season this year. Need to get you back on the show. The homie Dom right here, 72 Serp 702 Serpents, Trap Talk Patreon member. Then we have Welcome to the Grow Tent, Trap Talk Patreon member. Then we have Prolific Pythons. We have Lynn Rim Exotics. And look who it is. We're going to end it in fashion, folks. Ending it in fashion. We have Gary Shavino tapping in. It's late in his area, too. God bless him. He probably just got done doing some workouts. And uh, listen, Gary is definitely somebody I look up to in this game. I just know I just got done giving a bunch of props, but I'm going to do it again. Gary Shavino, you are the man. Thank you so much for, for uh, setting this up. Uh, and it, it, it's, it, it's about that time. Enough is enough, guys. I am so excited to bring you something so excited. But before we get into it, I need to let you guys know these episodes do get hot. They get heavy. So please make sure you have water. Stay hydrated. Okay, have a little bit of alcohol if needed, have some coffee, but make sure you have the juices flowing because it's about to get a little hot. It's about to get wicked. Trap Talk with Steve Volk coming right at you right now in the flesh. Coolest Reptile Podcast in the world, baby. Cheap. Good. You ready for do, do more in the future? Trap yes. Talk Podcasts? Yes. Man. Only, only Trap Talk. Exclusive. Yes. Exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> oh. So stop calling us. <laughs> <laughs> From the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, gotta love it, love it, and not I'm hot from the hop to the club to spot. Get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the everybody. Of amazingbasins.com. Is that what it is that what that is? Uh, well, the website is amazonbasins.com. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I meant to say Amazon. Excuse me. <laughs> wow, way to fumble that right off the beginning. I'm so sorry. But of hey, Amazon base amazonbasins.com. Is that's your website? I just want to be clear. Yes. Wow. Well, listen, what an honor. Uh, Steve, listen, you, I've, I've had a lot of people excited for this. I'm one of them, clearly, as you can tell. Um, but thank you for being here. How's everything on your side of Colorado? That's where you're at, Colorado, right? Yes, uh, Boulder, Colorado. It's excellent. Uh, we've got beautiful weather. Uh, the trees are turning. And <laughs> life is good. Listen, I'm from Southern California. I don't know about the whole trees turning thing, unfortunately. I don't really get a lot of that. But I do, I could say there was one time I flew in, like once this podcast thing started picking up and I was traveling, um, I believe I flew in uh, to Indiana, Indianapolis, and it was during the fall. And I looked out uh, as we were getting close to land and I saw nothing but red. And I was like, what is that? And the, it was the leaves were turning red, you know? And, and I thought that was one of the coolest things ever to see a season change like that. But where I'm from, we don't, you know, we're, 
we're very we have it made where i'm at i just gotta say when it comes to weather you know what i mean we, we have it all the time but i do like seasons i don't know how long have you been in colorado for if i if you don't mind me asking steve uh, since 87 uh, oh wow moved up here in, in uh, 1987 um i came from kansas city i actually uh lived in kansas city grew up in kansas city and was close friends with bob clark and we used to uh hang and uh exchange snakes and work on breeding and you know that's a, that's a pioneer yeah. That's a pioneer. That's a pioneer right there, Steve. If I may say so, right there. Oh, Bob yeah, Clark. Absolutely. What a guy. Um, I, I have to ask you, how did you run into a guy like Bob Clark? How did that happen? Uh, just a common interest. We became uh, friends uh, in the early days. You know, we were breeding Burmese pythons and keeping big retics and the whole nine yards. I mean, uh, back wow. then, nobody thought you could breed retics. Uh, ball pythons and other stuff, uh, so you know, um, Sri Lankan and but yeah, so Bob, as you know, um, made a career out of it. I, I, um, I didn't, I, I uh, got into the tech industry. I actually uh, left Kansas City, went to uh, school in North Carolina uh, at uh, Duke University, got a BS in zoology, and then came back to uh, Missouri, went to the University of Missouri Dental School. I uh, don't frequently admit it, but I've got a DDS. You know, I, uh, I never practiced, but I did go through and finished and took my boards and all that. But I got right into the tech industry, uh, wow. data storage. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. So you, you basically could have became a dentist, but you went the other route and got into the tech industry. Yeah, but uh, you know, I always had a, a very keen interest in reptiles and did a lot of stuff with Bob. And you know, Bob's family was in the clothing business. I don't know if you knew that. No, I didn't. Uh, they had a chain Bob, of stores. Uh, Bob's supposed to, Bob's supposed to be on this show. We we have a rain check, and you know that's that's in play, but it's going to happen. And I'm even happier now because now that I'm learning who Bob's friends with, somebody like you, this is going to be awesome. But please continue. Yeah, go go ahead. Oh yeah, so Bob's you know love uh, of reptiles you know started very early like mine did, but I went off and got in the data storage industry, uh, you know, uh, rotating magnetic and optical storage, and Bob, uh, the folks sent him from Kansas City down to Oklahoma City to one of their stores, hmm. and uh, you know, one day Bob told me uh, he said I I I'm not going to sell socks anymore. I'm going to do what I want to do, which is breed reptiles. And, you know, he's been very good at it. And he, yeah. he took some big risks early on with some of the uh, purchases on albino uh, Burmese pythons. And he really made a go of it. <clears throat> yeah. You know, listen, for to be around as, as long as somebody like Bob Clark and still be relevant, like to still have people wanting to buy snakes from you and, and, and be talked about and all this stuff. That's a lot, you know, like I, I give that guy a lot of props, you know, you know, I, you know, you understand though, too. I, I come from the newer side of this generation, you know, and there are people that have gotten snakes from Bob and, and, and nothing that they shouldn't be upset about, you know, but there are some things that people aren't too happy about. That's not why I would ever want to bring them on. I don't really give a crap about that because at the end of the day, it's a business, you know, you vote with your dollar, no one's telling you you have to buy animals from him. If you if that's the case, just don't buy animals from him. Buy some buy animals on some, somewhere else and just move on with your life. You know that's simply how I look at it. Um, but at the end of the day, you know it's it's all about who has done what. You know you, Bob has Bob is one of many people that people have like not latched onto, but just basically have been able to have in their in their circle that has made everything bigger for this whole hobby industry. I want to say you know like game changing stuff as you probably already know, Steve. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. I, I think uh, Bob's had quite a contribution. And yeah. with the volume of animals that he produces, um, you know, there's bound to be uh, some controversy. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. And hey, so, hey, go ahead. well, out here in Colorado, I, I lived down the street uh, from another pioneer 
not from a not so much from a breeding standpoint, but uh, Bushmasters, uh, Cameron. Cameron, wow, you're oh wow, you're close to Cameron. Yeah, uh, he's uh, about you know ten minutes away. Man, and, le legendary Steve. Oh my gosh, I've heard Bush Bushmaster stories from Forrest, rest in peace. Since like I don't, I can't even tell you since the get from the get go. You know what I mean? I've heard. You know, he he seems so like he's like a mystery to me. This Cameron guy, if I've heard so many stories, you know. <laughs> well, he uh, he's a good friend. He's a super guy, and uh, you know, I, I talk to him almost daily. But he's another pioneer because he, uh, as you know, uh, went to Indonesia, went to South America, and brought back you know some early species of a, a number of things that are now uh, propagated, captive bred here in the u.s he's right. quite a guy he works a lot with the zoos too i i listen you know we I kind of gave you a good breakdown on what i wanted to talk about tonight but i wasn't ready for you i wasn't ready for you to say that you dabbled with the big snakes at one point so i am curious i have to ask you steve um you know you said that there was a point in time where nobody said that you could breed with ticks like that was looked at like oh you can't like it, it, am i correct is that what you just yeah. said yeah what year was this well, I was probably uh, in the 80s. Uh, I, I'm not sure when retics, when they started breeding, breeding retics. Do you know who but, it was? You know who it was to break the mold? Or, you know, I mean, no. was it Kevin from Nerd? Or, like, who, who actually really made retics? Because I don't want to say they're easy, but I, I had a super dwarf retic this, this year, and everything went well. I don't, I mean, like I said, I, I don't want to say they're easy, but, you know, I have my buddy Andrew Acevedo, who's, like, one of the, he's one of the best super dwarf breeders, and he's really good at it, so... I'm curious if you happen to even know what the turn was like or who, or who was even involved with it. No, I, I, I really don't. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure, you know, Bob Clark could, when he comes on your show, could give you Perfect. the full history. But I, um, it was just a thing back, uh, you know, in the 80s that retics don't breed in captivity. And wow. I, I don't know who turned it or how it got turned, but I had – uh, big retics. I, I, I never even tried to breed them. You always wanted to get a female so you could get, you know, a 150 pound animal. I don't know if I just skipped steps really soon here, Steve, but man, as soon as those retics, so I got into retics pretty quickly. Like I think even before I got into chondros, I got into retics. You know, I had a really good buddy of mine who was kind of getting out of the retic game. I wonder why, you know, he was probably ahead of the curve, but he was hooking me up but god damn i was not ready for these things to become like you know it's one thing when they come in small right oh what a cute little noodle right as they say um but they grow quick right and 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 you notice if you don't give them the right space they let you know that they need more space by they shove they they do things they mess they they mess themselves up and you have you have no other choice but to look like why are they doing this is it too hot so either way it got to a point where not even four by twos were keeping these things you know how I wanted to keep them, and it got it got bad. You know, and I knew right right away, Steve. I did not want to stuff these mainlands into something that small. I knew I had to get them something nice and big. So before it got too worse, I was able to jump ship. I was able to go ahead and just find the right people, of course. But all twelve of my mainlands whew, gone. Just I was like, no, thank you. Not dealing with that shit. I, I you know, God bless people who work with retics that are mainlands because they need. You know, I, I, I want to say almost everyday maintenance from what I was dealing with. You know, I'm sure there's a hack where you learn how to keep them less messy, but I'm an OCD guy. So if I come in and I see that they're swimming in their own urates or they're, you know, there's water spill, I have to change it. I can't just go on about my day and just be like, all right, take care of that in three days, you know, on, on cleaning day, you know, and, and that was driving me crazy. And, and I was becoming more obsessed with things that are, I mean, come on, let's compare keeping retics to emeralds. <laughs> Yeah. It's, like a, it's like a walk in the park. It's but it's like, what am I doing? Like, but listen, everyone has their own taste, their own cup of tea. You know, I, I I just started realizing what I wanted, and I realized what I wanted didn't have to be so workload heavy and, and dangerous. I want to say, I mean, I have nerve damage in my pinky from a large retic. My dad took seventeen stitches from a large retic. Like you don't, <clears throat> you just never know. You know, those things could mess you up, as you probably already know. Yes. <laughs> But what year was it when you kind of – now I'm curious when the transition happened, okay? Because obviously 
you know, you knew snakes were something that needed to be a part of your life. When was it and who was it that got you into emeralds? How did this happen? Well, I'd always had a keen interest in them. Uh, and whenever you would see them for sale, you know, folks would, I mean, the rap they had early on uh, was that they're mean as hell, right. they'll bite you, and then they'll die. Uh, they always always died. Uh, and the uh, Amazon basins, I, I, I didn't realize what a difference there uh, is between a, a, a northern and a basin. Right. And uh, I, I actually, when I when I came here to uh, Colorado, uh, I, I didn't uh, have any snakes. I left all the, all the snakes behind, and was uh, so focused on uh, these uh, data storage uh, startups that I I did. You know, we we did one company where we invented the uh, two and a half inch hard drive, uh, and, and we're building those. You know, we had factories in Singapore and. Um, I was going back and forth to Asia almost weekly. So there just wasn't any time uh, doing that and raising a family. But about 15 years ago or so, uh, I wanted to get back into it and uh, wanted to uh, get into basins. And I reached out to uh, Tony Nikolai. And huh. I'm sure you know that, uh, that name, you know, Tony. I've had Tony on the, I've had Tony on the show. Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. So, you know, you know, Tony was really the pioneer. Uh, he, uh, you know, lives in Jacksonville and he uh, spent years going down, getting the purchasing the imports and I mean, he took all the arrows, but he was uh, successful in reproducing them. And I think a lot of the stock that's uh, currently in this country uh, came from Tony Nikolai. He is the the pioneer breeder. Are, talk, are you saying basins or northerns? Basins. Wow. Okay. And 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 so when you say that, I'm, I'm curious because you know, no disrespect to Tony. You know, I've heard a lot of great things of Tony Nikolai. You know, but from what I understand, there's more Ed Marino stock out there when it comes to basins than there is Tony. And, and like I said, I could be wrong, but from you know I, that's that's my understanding as of today are you talking pretense you know as far as what got the hobby to what it is today are you are you saying even to today there's more nikolai stuff out there than there is merino well uh, tony got out of it but you know a lot of merino's stock uh, uh came from uh, tony too i mean mm. uh, i think uh early on uh, ed was into northerns um I but know that, yeah. Yeah, and uh, was uh, very successful with Northerns. And But I think that everybody's getting their uh, stuff from uh, Tony because he, he was very successful. Now, uh, you know, he, he got out of it for a while, but now he's getting back in. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy because obviously everything came from something, right? You know, and, and I feel like a lot of the reasons why maybe something's more talked about is because that person does get out, you know what I mean? But that's, you know, kudos to the person who keeps the legacy going. That's what it's all about, right? But I will say, I, I'm curious as far as, do you know, Tony, who he was getting his stuff from? Like, what, did oh, he yeah, have any? It was who? all imports. It was all, all imports, wild. right? Yeah. And, and, and I'm curious, Steve, with, with importers back then, was it one person really getting these imports? Was it multiple people? Like, how, how did the import game really work with these back then? Well, I think a lot of them came through uh, Florida, came into Florida. I, I, I don't know the importers. I mean, it, I, obviously, I knew uh, Cameron right. uh, very well. Um, how, but, how, old, how old is Cameron, if you don't mind me asking? I always feel like Cameron's a young person, but how old is Cameron, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, I, I, fifty plus okay. or minus. Yeah, just, just, just curious. I was just curious. I don't know why Cameron just sounds like such a young name, and I was always curious if Cameron was a young guy or or whatnot. But I was like, there's no way because I've heard his name go back years, like from like you know years back. So, um, okay. Uh, so yeah. Anyways, back to what we were saying. You know, a lot of. So you're saying a lot of your stuff that you could give, give credit to today. Um, by the way, can you throw out the number of basins you currently have in your collection as of today? 
Yeah, I've got uh, about 65 animals. All basins? Just basins? Oh, yeah, just basins. Can, can, you, can you put your hand like this to the screen? Put your hand. Put, I just want to shake it. <laughs> okay. I, that, I mean, hello. I mean, listen, I just got a trio. I, I, I've been in this the game for five years, Steve, and I'm on my third one. I, if I could have it my way, I would have nothing but basins. I'm not joking. I am not joking. I'm not there yet. But I, I just would like I, I love that I'm talking to somebody, you know what I mean? And and you know, I had Ed Marino on the show, and when he told me how many bases he had, my, my face melted. So, but I know that this isn't something that overcomes over a couple of years. This is just years in the making. Like this is stuff that you built since when? What year was this when you got into basins? Uh it was about uh 15 years ago. So 2007? Yeah. yeah. So that's not that long. I mean, it's long ago. Don't get me wrong, but it's not that like it's not like you know Nikolai stuff like or and Marino stuff like in the '90s and stuff. Correct? Like this, you came in in the in the beginning of the 2000s. Yes, that's correct. Okay, and I'm curious before we start getting deep into the emeralds, what kind of income were you making with animals, regardless before you even invested into basins? Like, what, what, what was that like? What, were you just keeping because of the love, or were you breeding and making money? What was happening then? Um, well, uh, you mean before basins? Yes, yes. Leading no. up to 2007, I want. I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, when I was uh, in dental school, uh, I was breeding a lot of Burmese pythons, and that helped, uh, you know, pay for school. Okay. And so with that being said, the basins, right? Um, the fact that, I don't know, this is about 20 or 15 years ago. How much knowledge was out there that you were able to retain before even picking up a basin? Like, where were you kind of picking up your info from? Where were you researching? Like, how are you really getting this information? Because I, and you seem like, obviously you seem like a really smart guy, right? So I'm curious, what were you, what were you generating information wise before you even did this jump into the basins? Well, I, um, I looked at what Tony was doing uh, and, I, and I, I took what I thought was right. Uh, and I, uh, I, I took it and I changed what I didn't believe was correct. I mean, uh, back then he was, he had all acrylic cages mm -hmm. and with water drawers. So, uh, the animals were defecating in the same water that they were drinking. And yeah. mm. I, you know, again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a technologist, uh, and just looking at the, uh, the way that those drawers were constructed, you know, they were, um, uh, solvent bonded, uh, plexiglass, and there's no way to clean them effectively. Right. So, you know, I, I knew that wasn't right. Um, so, you know, and also I, I felt like the animals were uh, unduly stressed with the clear acrylic cages. But in spite of that, you know, as I mentioned, Tony was very successful. And I know right. uh, Ed got a lot of a stock from him, as I did. And the, the cool thing about the animals that came from Tony, because he was uh, – so heavily involved with the importers, he had a very diverse uh, line of animals. You know, the, the gene pool was very large. And I, I think that, uh, you know, nowadays, um, you know, I, I've got such a large investment in basins that, that I pretty much uh, have a closed system. And I, uh, I think uh, Ed's the same way too. Oh yeah, you know, very reluctant to bring in new animals. Um, if you know, maybe a baby here and there. But I it, mean, uh, yeah, continue. Yeah, so you know, you just want to make sure uh, you want to eliminate that variable. Now uh, you know. Yeah. Go ahead. Hey, what well, I was going to get, in, what I was going to get into next, Steve, is you know, as much as everyone wants a basin, you know, and, you know, people don't understand what what what's ahead when it comes to wanting to get one. Not only financially, but not the hardest thing to keep, right? But let's talk about if you want to breed it. 
Okay. Um, a lot of people that I respect who've bred a lot of many things come into the basin side of things and they run into a wall. They can't really figure it out. Some are lucky. I mean, shoot, I have two of my good friends, Socrates and Allen, total combined, have lost six basins within the last two years. And we're talking females that were gravid. We're talking females gravid and just, you know, full term living, not living. They were dead, obviously, inside the female, but stuff like that. And I'm curious on how many of those hor horrific type scenarios did you have to experience before you actually got things down or or, or, or was it that not or is that not the case with you? Did you not have to deal with a lot of death? No, uh, I did. We all did. And, and we all occasionally still do with uh, retaining ovum right. and, uh, you know, stillborn animals. And, you know, some years you uh, produce 20, 30 babies, 40 babies. <clears throat> In other years, you'll have six. So that's one thing that I've really been working on is to, you know, taking a lot of notes, a lot of observation, a lot of experimentation mm -hmm. to try to get this process down. Um, you know, you, you still get the occasional animal that slugs out or has a uh, some stillborn babies. So I think there's, there's a lot that we don't know still uh, on breeding this species. I mean, coming from somebody who's literally been in this game for 15 plus years, I feel like that's the story of the reptile game altogether. We're always going to have stuff where we just can't figure out, you know? Um, and that's why I, I like working with stuff like this. Um, I mean, you know, as dangerous as it can be, like I, breeding ball pythons just doesn't do it for me. It really doesn't. Even though I respect it and it got me into this and I won't stop. Trust me, I only have this because of ball pythons. If it wasn't for ball pythons, None of this would even be here, you know, plain and simple. So I always sure. keep the ball. I always keep the ball pythons, right? But they don't give me enough hurt. I like. I like to hurt. I don't know what it is, but I like to learn a hard lesson. If you want to talk about hard lessons, I hadn't even got into the emeralds yet. I mean, I've been learning hard lessons off these chondros. Have you ever done chondros, Steve? Like, wow, talk about a heartbreak. Oh my gosh. You know, go ahead. Yeah. No, I had some, you know, early, early on, you know, when I lived back in Kansas City, and they, uh, of course they all died, you know. <laughs> Sorry to me to laugh, but it's like, wow, what else, you know? Well, they're all well-caught uh, specimens, you know, and even when you warmed them and worked on them. I mean, we didn't know what temperatures to keep them at or what the humidity should have been, overfed them, and, you know, it was early days. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, the condor guys are, are doing an excellent job nowadays but yeah for sure I get I, the I, in the in the 15 years or so that um i've been involved with uh, the basins i think things have come oh, really come a long way it, it's it's been years since i've had a respiratory issue <clears throat> right um and a lot of it has to do with um i, I do a lot with the caging you know i, I uh teamed up with Habitat Systems, if you... Oh, yeah, I know who that is. Yeah, so, and they, I would design cages, they would uh, fabricate them, and I got a lot of uh, uh, controls, automated controls for uh, consistency. And so, uh, we got we say, ready for... Can we, say, can we say shout to Tom one time? Shout to Tom. Is he listening? Is Tom here? <laughs> I, I, I think Tom's online. Uh, you know, that um, yeah, what a guy, man. You know, a man of few words, but ask him questions, he'll give you answers. And man, did I ask him some northern questions for sure? He's he asked me, he knows his stuff for sure, man. Shout, shout out to Tom. Tom, if you're listening to this for whatever reason, or if you hear this, shout out to you, sir. I had a good time meeting you over at Tinley. <laughs> yeah, Tom has done an amazing job. He's got uh, an amazing setup. Obviously, owning Habitat Systems, you can imagine uh, what his uh, setup looks like. It's you know, wall to wall uh, habitat systems, cages, and they're they're it's, it's a if you can get to Des Moines, uh, it's really worth uh, seeing his collection. He got everything. Uh, we were playing with his little uh, baby cabins. They, uh, wow, he's got all kinds of stuff. I, all right, I, yeah, uh, venomous. Yeah, I, as cute as they are, I, I 
I, I don't think I would be I don't think I'd be alive with venomous because I'm the kind of guy that when I go through, when I go through the collection and I see you gotta touch it. Yeah. It's, well, you yeah. see a little piece of uh, shed. You just reach in and with the basin, you can just reach in and, uh, you know, take it off. So yeah, I wouldn't. Have to. Steve, I, I got to say, want to know how I know I was meant to be in this game and you know, how I meant to do what I'm doing today? I'll tell you how. OK, my whole life, I've done everything you shouldn't have done. Like I'm talking about like everything's going right for you. Why would you do that? Like, why? would you do that and i just don't could never explain why i did what i did to really mess up what it is i had going for me but the one thing i got rid of that could have easily ruined all this was my one pet rattlesnake that i had i uh before everything grew to what it was my good buddy victor shout out to my boy victor out there he you know i've told this story on this podcast before but so what you have to hear it again um my good buddy Victor came to me one time. He's like, hey, man, I have to go to court tomorrow. My my baby mama is threatening me to tell the judge that I have this rattlesnake with our kid and I can't have it. And I'm like, well, what do you want me to do? He's like, dude, look at it. It's really cute. He had it in a Coca-Cola bottle, mind you. He put it in a Coca-Cola bottle and he's like, he's like, my buddy caught this in her. Like he told me the whole story and I'm like, oh, my God. I was like, just give it to me. Like, just just give it to me. And so I set it up in, in a tank and, you know took me 30 days to get it to eat but sure enough it ate and it started taking off steve this thing this thing grew like into an adulthood and it was the most nicest docile thing ever i would hold it i was like this is the best thing ever and then guess what happened steve my wife walks in my wife knows what a rattlesnake is she knows i should not be touching that okay so what do you think started happening after that steve she kept walking in when i was holding it and then it became a problem okay and then I will tell you, too, I was sending videos of my buddy Forrest, who's no longer here, and Miguel. I was sending videos of me holding it. And even my friends were like, hey, like, you shouldn't do that. Like, and I'm like, I don't, I'm like, this is amazing. Look at me. Like, look at me. This is so cool. You know what I mean? But it was a rush. I can't really explain anything but the rush I felt. And, and I didn't put it out there on my platforms. Like, it was just my own personal, like, enjoyment. Like, I really enjoyed it, Steve. Like, there was, like, something in my heart racing touching like knowing that if this thing turned around and tagged me we're gonna have a lot of problems and i was enjoying that like i wanted it but after two years of watching my wife cry to me telling me she had nightmares i had to make the big boy move and i had to get rid of it and uh, i'm glad i did i mean listen that was my that's the one thing steve just like you my wife's crying telling me she has nightmares and i still couldn't put the snake down i couldn't put it down like i just couldn't I knew I knew it wasn't gonna bite me, but do we know? No. So I'm on your side with that, Steve. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> it's a dangerous world. Okay, now we were talking about caging habitat systems. No longer available. You can't get that caging anymore. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Listen, generous guy right here. Is that for our next carrot cake? Carrot cake right here. This is a a. a what was what was your scale one through ten on that carrot cake at dinner last Saturday, Steve? Well, it was uh, enough to feed a whole army. The one pea. <laughs> uh, I thought it was good. Yeah, you know, Marshall was so impressed that he got carrot cake three times after that and was not impressed. He didn't want like he, for whatever reason he kept ordering carrot cake, thinking he was going to get the same kind of carrot cake high he got on dinner Saturday night, and it just didn't happen. High expectations, um, but listen. I'm putting this 50 bucks into next Tinley's carrot cake uh, little bank there. That's 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 what that's going to. Thank you, Gary Shavino. But Habitat Systems, back on topic here. Um, so many different ways to keep things, right, Steve? I mean, no right or wrong, I guess. Whatever works for you. But I, I feel like a lot of people get so gun ho about wanting to do what's natural for an arboreal snake. Like, you know, put it over a bioactive system and whatnot. Um, how do you keep your snakes and how have you always kept your snakes or has there ever been a, a transition? Like, did, did you ever go bioactive and switch things up? I'm curious on how the husbandry has always been for your basins. Yeah. Uh, no, I started out, um, with the basins with vision cages and, um, uh, moved on to, um, the habitat systems. And basically, you know, I could, uh, draw them up and design them and then, uh, habitat would build them. 
And there's a, uh, a lot of innovation in the cages there. Uh, you can see them on my website. But some of the key uh, uh, features of them are the, the perches, which are fabricated by Ron Rundo. Right. And uh, who, who wow. makes an amazing, you know, each one's hand sculptured. But they're yeah. interchangeable. Although each one is a, a hand sculpture, uh, you know, using a, epoxy resin, resin, right? You can lift uh, a perch out of one cage and put it into another cage. Um, so that I, it was a hard concept for me to explain to Ron. He said, "No, no, you don't understand. They're all different." And I said, "I understand they're all different, but their uh, anchor points are going to be identical, so that they're all interchangeable." Because one thing I learned early on is, um, and, and a lot of guys have made these mistakes, you know, I was using Delrin uh, perches and uh, they were too large diameter and they weren't varied in diameter. And uh, as the adults would grow up, I would have uh, kink tails. So that was one of the things I did with the uh, habitat uh, setup is that uh, I had Ron Rondo uh, make all the perches so I can pick up a perch when an animal's on, on it, when the basin's on it, and move it around. I can, in my rain chambers, they will accept that those same perches. So I'm never in a position that I have to peel off uh, a basin from a perch. I think that's a, a stressful, uh, you know, uh, uh, event for them. So I can, Here's a yeah. Here's the thing. You don't have to pull anything off a perch. It, you, there are things you can do to get them to move off the perch naturally, right? Oh, um, yeah. Rain chamber is definitely one of them, and, and I'm glad you brought up rain chamber because Gary's like, MJ, you need to bring up uh, Steve's rain chambers uh, techniques and how you do that because I really feel like that's a huge importance on making sure things don't go south for a basin where things are so backed up. I think people don't understand how there are – things i don't know if it's just because how we keep them or where they're at but there's there's things that we physically need to do sometimes to get these to defecate you know um and 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 some people i don't want to say a lot of people but some people feel like well you shouldn't have to do anything like if you're having to put your snake in a rain chamber that's a problem um and i'm curious on how what you think about that like you know first and foremost well i think um i, I have two active rain chambers uh, uh right now and I, I think they're essential, and for a number of reasons. Um, for the obvious, if you see a snake that is loading up a little bit, you don't want there to be pressure on the cloaca. And they are basically waiting. I mean, out in the wild, they would wait for rain uh, to defecate. And uh, when it rains, they drop their tail. And, and for a very... Simple, simple reason. It's for survival, so that that uh, fecal matter and urates are washed away, so that that uh, predator can't find them. So th they are already in a situation where they're waiting for the rain to uh, ha have a, a movement. Um, that's one reason. Um, right. The other reason is even though we provide uh, clean water for them. Uh, I, I use elevated bowls. They don't drink as much as they should. And I, I noticed this in the rain chamber. When you, when you do put an animal uh, in the rain chamber, they will drink for maybe 20 minutes, just constantly drinking. Yeah. So uh, that's another way. And the rain chambers uh, that I have, uh, again, I designed them and they were built by Habitat Systems. Um, they have temperature control units, you know, because you want to warm up a rain chamber. I, I use 90 degrees. Um, and then shut it down and then put the animal in. And again, it's super easy. Lift them off, uh, uh, you know, the whole perch, set it in the rain chamber, close the door and uh, slowly turn on the water. Water's the right temperature. The chamber's been warmed up and it's just a wonderful experience. So for the occasional uh, animal that is a little bit loaded up, uh, for a gravid female 
to make sure that she is hydrated. If she's not hydrated, uh, she's going to, uh, when she uh, delivers, she's going to retain ovum because her uh, oviduct is just going to be too sticky if she's not well hydrated. And that is a, that's a death sentence oftentimes. Uh, it may take a year or 18 months, but uh, she'll try to wall it off. But that, those retained ovum, sounds like you may have had some folks. And we've all been through this. This isn't just right. unique to me. Well, listen, here, here's the thing, Steve. I mean, I've even dealt with, and I know we're talking about completely different species here, but I've even dealt with some ball python females that went well over their 30-day their after, you know, because typically after 30 days of the pre lay shed, you should get that clutch, right? Well, I've even had females go like close to day 50, right? And it was some scary stuff. But, you know, I, I, I just tend, if, if they're holding on to the eggs that long, what I did with my females is I would take them out and I would just move them for a little bit, get them kind of moving. But then I would also soak them too. I would soak them for not a long time, you know, but maybe like five to 10 minutes. And literally, I'm talking nine out of 10 times, if not 10 out of 10 times, the next day I would see them on a clutch of eggs. I'm not joking. Like I'm not here to just just make stuff up. I promise you. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm talking about this now is because, you know, we my boy Alan, you know, just went through a, a really bad ordeal with his female stroke, which was a. Uh, one of those uh, reduced pattern. There was like, I guess it's called an HQ stripe, I believe. Um, but one of those striped uh, basins that I think it was day 215 post ovulation, uh, post ovulation shed, or I can't remember, but day 215, I believe, is when, you know, he, you know, didn't, didn't induce her. He just came downstairs and she was rolled out dead, you know. Um, but from what I understand, nobody really soaks their basin or anything like you, you don't soak your basin if they're going that long or do you, or, 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 or is that something that nobody really thought about? I'm just curious. Um, no, I don't soak basins. Um, I, I, I but I will, um, like a, a gravid female, I will put her in the rain chamber and sometimes leave her in there for maybe three or four hours. Cause I know wow. I, I have confidence uh, you know, it's just drizzling on her, right? But she's drinking, and I know she's getting hydrated. You, you know, we when we went through this retain ovum thing, and you know, every breeder I've talked to has had this problem. You know, um, we tr you know tried surgery, and I, you know I have uh, ultrasound here, and you know surgery to remove the uh, retained ovum and all that kind of stuff, and. Yeah, the, this oftentimes the snake will survive, but it's it's not the same uh, for them. And I, I don't know that, at least in my experience, I don't think I've ever gotten a female that retained ovum uh, that had surgery years later. I've never gotten them to breed again to successfully have a clutch. So, uh, so you know, kind of gone through these phases where we've eliminated these problems. It used to be that, uh, you know, you would auto mist these, you know, some people, myself included, would auto mist the animals um, to try to, to stimulate what happens out uh, in the Amazon basin. And that mm -hmm. oftentimes led to respiratory problems. So, uh, I switched to misting the substrate, not the animal. And then uh, periodically uh, uh, put, putting, uh, especially females, uh, in the rain chamber to get hydrated. The, the other reason to use a rain chamber, there, there's actually, uh, there's numerous reasons. There's a hydration, which is paramount. Uh, there is the, uh, when you see somebody loaded up, and you want to relieve that, you know, it takes about five minutes before that tail comes down when you're raining on them and for them to defecate. Uh, the other reason, it, sometimes when I see an animal at the end of their shed cycle, uh, just for the hell of it, uh, I will oftentimes lift up, you know, open the cage. I've got magnetic latches instantly. That was another uh, innovation that uh, habitat systems did for me so i don't have flat yes. on the cages there there's just a top and bottom uh you know they're glass tempered glass 
you, you just open them up. Uh, so it's very easy, very quick. Put um, a female that, or an animal that you think is about to shed in the rain chamber, leave them in for three or four hours and they will complete the shed and defecate. It's a, a beautiful thing. Uh, and, you know, and it's funny. Fourth, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, Steve. Okay, the fourth reason to uh, utilize the rain chamber is um, after a female has a litter, gives birth, um, almost 99% of the time, if you put them in the rain chamber, uh, they will expel uh, additional uh, crap after birth. They just do it. I'm going to do a timeout right now, Steve, and I'm going to keep this, because there's probably kids watching, I'm going to keep this very kid-friendly when I say this, okay? Sure. But if there's anybody out there watching this and they're like, oh, my God, this guy is saying so much amazing information and you're not hitting that like button, you have issues. I just want to say that, okay? Get the likes up right now for my man, Steve. Bo are, are, are we kidding me? Let's get the likes up. Seriously. Earmuffs. Don't be a chump. Okay, sorry, parents. That's all I had to say. But let's get the likes up from the homie Steve Volk. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate it. Let's continue. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Steve. I, I have to let them know. You know, this is an amazing podcast. History in the making right now, okay? May I, may I mind you, okay? Sorry about that. Thank you, Gary, for the reminder. Um, but listen, I want to go back to what we were talking about here. Um, you know, when it comes to Northerns, I mean, first off, have you ever bred Northerns? Uh, just so I can know from my own knowledge, Steve. Have you ever done no, work I, with Northerns? I'm I've sorry, not bred Northerns. Have, okay, you haven't. Okay. Um, that being said, what is your what has what was it with the basins when it was your first year that you produced that you realized you did something right? Like, what was the one thing that you realized that it was with the basins that they needed for them to kind of breed? Well, I think it was uh, the temperature profile, um, and, and I've refined that over the years, um, and I I do. Uh, shorten the photo period. Uh, I'll go to uh, in the November time frame. I will go to eleven hours. You know, eleven and thirteen hours. Eleven hours on, thirteen hours off, and then I'll go because I I, I worked with uh, Robert Henderson. I don't know if you've read any of his books. I haven't. Robert Henderson. No. I have, well, do you have, do you have a book out there that you recommend by him? Well, he's just. Um, he did a lot of uh, field work on, uh, you know, where he found the uh, northerns and basins. And, and what I did was um, I cross-referenced uh, where he was finding these animals. And then I looked at the um, weather, weather patterns and the light cycle. Because we just all assumed that it, was, it should be 12-12. It's not the case at all uh, in the Amazon basin. I mean, can we really be fair here? Because Steve, I like to just match what I have here at my own house. You know, like I, I mean, as the sun goes down, my lights go down. As the sun comes up, my lights go up. I just do that. Is that okay? Oh yeah, I think so. I, I think that I, I've thought about doing that too. I, I, anything that shows um, a differential. So you're um, using a, a photoelectric sensor. No, so for instance, I have I'm there in a room where they have windows. The windows are open. Sun hits in when it hits in, but they also have their own lighting. You know, technically it's dark outside and their lights are still on. I personally don't think it's the end of the world that they're staying up a little later, you know, like this isn't like, you know, I, I, their their lights are maybe going a little couple hours than normal. Um but do you feel like that has an effect? Like do you, you know, listen, I have buddies of mine who are like by the book. I'm talking about like we I've done podcast is at their place and they're like sorry we can't go to my room i can't have the lights on the lights can't be on and i'm like wow like i understand but i mean in your opinion do you feel like that's a huge like like determination like oh my god if the, that light cycle isn't on then they might not breed i mean i'm curious and while you're talking i i, I have a restroom right here i got to use it but I'm, I'm, i want to hear your your, your analogy on this if you don't mind with the whole light with the lighting and whatnot and if it's more important than like food cycling or something sure
Go, go ahead and talk. I'm listening. I can okay. hear you. Okay. Yeah, I can hear. I can hear everything you're saying. I can hear everything you're saying. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully, we won't hear you. Okay. So, um, I don't know. You know, part of the problem here is this takes so long. Uh, you know, you can only breed an animal uh, a basin every two years. So, uh, if this was, if we were really being scientific about this, we would change only one variable uh, in a breeding cycle. But the fact is, um, we do, I do, change multiple variables, and and I feel uh, comfortable with reducing the light cycle because. Again, uh, looking at uh, Henderson's book, and he, he shows uh, geographically where, where the animals were found, what type of animals, and so on. And I made the correlation, and I, I'll go down to a, a 10 hour uh, a light cycle. And it, it's just uh, one additional variable. And I also studied the, uh, the temperatures too. Uh, is it possible to for someone to breed successfully breed basins without screwing with the light cycle sure right uh, i'm not saying that that's absolute and yeah uh sometimes you go into your uh one of your snake rooms at night and there's some some something that needs to be taken care of and you turn the lights on i don't think that's the end of the world i don't think it's that critical <sighs> But you know what's funny, Steve? As much as I'm saying this, things change when those lights come off, from what I know. Like, once those lights are off, you know, look, you see them. They're perched up right now, right? But I could even tell you, if I even shut these light, their lights off but keep these lights on, some of them will start, they'll, they'll start moving. You know what I mean? It's almost like an alarm clock for them. Like, they, they, they have a sense, like, a safetyness when, that, when it's pitch dark. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, like I said, this isn't an everyday thing. Like I'm pretty on point when it comes to their lights being off and on. I'm mainly doing this because it looks good. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's going to have a huge like effect on me pairing them up this year. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, but listen, there's so many things that I pay attention to, Steve, that I make sure I, I, I know that, okay, if this is what I see, this is what I should really uh, consider. And frequent water changes. I was brought into this game with the mentality that, you know, everything's on a schedule, right? You, you feed every so often. You change water every so often. Well, no, you should not change water every so often. You should change water often, if not every day. I feel like that's a huge, huge factor, just how we were talking about, because what makes you not think, and let's say you're keeping a good handful of these animals, what makes you not think this animal just pooped in its water? You know what I'm saying? Like they do that immediately sometimes. Like I've seen it. Sometimes I've seen like just as I change their water, they have poop in their water. By the way, Steve, how am I doing with the cuss words? I think I'm doing a really good job. I think you I'm are. doing a, I think I'm doing a heck of a job. Heck you, of a job. You're doing a great job. I don't want to I don't, don't want to jinx myself. <laughs> well, you've got young young fans that are um... it, and this is what it's all about. You know, it's funny. I started realizing the whole like, you know, hey, Steve, I started doing that's a good off topic, but started doing this just because i wanted information i didn't care about people's kids i didn't care about oh i'm sorry you want me to it was all about me 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 but you know i went to a big event called animal con and i met a lot of kids and it made me change my whole delivery like i you, you think i wanted to you know moderate a q a panel with these 12 year olds staring at me like you, i can't just you know what i mean so i that's why I, I felt like i'm ready for this i i'm glad you told me that there are children watching this because i'm ready for this situation am i gonna say i'm gonna stop cussing forever no but i can adapt i can easily adapt especially for my man steve volk here um but anyways back to was that gary who's who's texting you mid who's texting you mid podcast is it somebody legendary i gotta ask you who is it oh <laughs> it's gary who is it actually it's amy benzie Amy Ben, oh my gosh! Talk about a girl who works with Basin, who's come on this show. I, she's the only girl I've ever had on this show that works with Basin, Amy Benzie. And man, is she? If you want to talk about your number one fan, that's Amy Benzie, man. I'm, I'm telling you, Steve, she loves you. Well, she's incredible, and uh, she is. She she says, I, I don't think she'll mind me reading this. She says, "Wow, no cussing, you rock." <laughs> 
Amy, to be fair, if you would have gave me the same heads up, I would have considered it. You know what I'm saying? You know, Steve's just on top of his P's and Q's. You can't, you know, Steve just knows he's on it. You know, listen, Amy Benzi, what a girl, what a lady. I, I got to say, um, she she did nothing but give you mad props the entire episode, Steve. And, and it's crazy before I even heard about you through Gary, which, you know, Gary had nothing but great things to say about you, too. It's kind of crazy how stars align the way they do. You know, I, I got to say, this is this is why what makes this episode so great. You know, I I really, you know, I've heard about your work. My buddy Socrates and you know, other people have Steve Volk line in their projects, right? But I never really heard about you the way I heard about you through Amy and then Gary. So I will say, Amy, props to you, Amy, because this, this, this is why this is so exciting right now. So um, and you You've no doubt seen her videos. I mean, her environment, yeah. the environment. She's killing uh, it. Uh, yeah, totally. And uh, you know, she went. I mean, she 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 wa uh, walks the walk, talks right. the talk. You know, she went went to the, the Amazon and uh, actually, she is a snake whisperer because you know what it's like. Uh, these wild. Uh, caught northerns they're not the friendliest thing in the world and seeing those videos of her finding them in the wild and just picking them up i was impressed i mean i will say though she had a little rocky start okay because i i think you might have told her this steve and she went into the podcast having one of her females out and that female wanted to take her face off <laughs> what, what? oh my well, god she she has so many amazing names, but listen, you know I'm right when it comes to this, Steve. There's just a certain point in time where your most docile snake, I don't care what it is, they know something's happening. And what I mean, we were live, cameras rolling, lights on. That snake knew that this was not a typical let me out and hang out thing. Like, it was literally like, like trying to like, like, she's like, oh no, it's not upset. I'm like, Amy, put that snake away. That snake does not want to be out right now. She's like, you're wrong. You're wrong. And eventually she had to put that snake back because it was not happy. Um, <laughs> oh my God. It was, it was iconic. It was, it was iconic. But listen, you, you think I've interviewed so many people with a setup like Amy's to have that setup and to have everything all coordinating within itself. It's freaking amazing. Like that's man, that's, and, and she's not, she hasn't been doing this for 15 years either. Like this is, she's kind of a, she's kind of a noob, you know? So yes. I, I give her props. Shout out to Amy. Happy basins. Thanks for being here. Um, but let's get back to nitty gritty of things. I'm curious here, Steve, when uh, you started investing into basins, was it babies you started picking up? Or was it adults? Whatever you can get. Let's talk about the kind of animals you were pick, picking up in, in the beginning of the, 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 the foundation that you have now. Oh, it was mostly babies and uh, raised them up. And, uh, you know, a lot of them uh, came again from uh, Nikolai. And they're very uh, varied in the gene pool. So check this out. One thing that I realized that it's not true, maybe it's with basins, but maybe, I, you know, I don't know. I do have three basins now, and I don't feed them too big, but they can handle a good-sized meal. So a basin can handle a good-sized meal. So can a northern, Okay. Um, but guess what? Some of the stuff I first started working with would puke up a meal. And I'm like, what? Like, what is this all about? Like I'm, and it really threw me in the loop. I'm like, are we supposed to just feed them really small meals? And it turns out, you know, these imports come up messed up. They come in with some stuff, you know, crypto, whatnot, you know, how much of the regurgitation stuff have you dealt with, with basins? And, and was it mostly in the beginning or is it even to this day? What's going on with the re regurgitation uh, or well, deal with your basins? Yeah, it doesn't seem to be very common in basins. Um, it, it's uh, it's very, very rare in basins. And there's lots of speculation uh, that on the that the northerns uh, the imports are kept uh, with birds and that, you know, you hear these stories about they keep the basins underneath in a cage and the birds are above them and the, the birds are defecating on, on the snakes. And so the snakes come in. So there's all kinds of speculation and that uh, the 
basins when they were imported, even those didn't seem to be, I mean, Tony had a lot of problems and it ultimately uh, uh, knocked out his collection, but I don't know how much of it, I don't think he was seeing a lot of regurgitation with basins, but you, when you have him on the show, you need to ask him. It doesn't seem to be very common with, with basins, but I do think um, in general uh, that folks that keep emeralds, whether they're northerns or basins, overfeed the animals. It, their metabolism is really, really slow. You know, and this comes from somebody who got into these arboreals off of ball pythons, and you could feed the living crap out of a ball python, let's just say that, like, to the point where you don't even realize that you're probably killing this animal, like, but you don't know because it, it won't throw up. We'll just keep eating, you know, right. like, we'll keep eating, but this is why I love what I work with, Steve. Everything I work with is making me realize just because they could get away with it doesn't mean they need to eat so much. And I don't even think ball pythons need to eat that much. I really don't. It all comes down to a cycle, you know, like obviously growing them up, like, which I, I, I need to ask you. I mean, what are, what are, what is it that you like to start your basins on? Let's talk about your baby bait. You're talking about your freshly dropped littered basins has its first shed. First off, you wait for a first shed, correct? Before you offer it a meal. Yeah, uh, I, I do. And you know that, uh, I don't know where that came from, but it just seems to be, a rule that is written in stone. Uh, I, I imagine you could try to feed them before, but uh, it just seems to be better all, all around to wait until they have their first shed um, because then you know the yolk has been all absorbed. If there's right. some additional healing and growth that needs to occur uh, in the digest digestive tract, that can, so I just think it's a better practice. But when I have uh, a litter, uh, you know, uh, the first thing I'll try after everybody sheds, I'll try frozen thawed uh, rat pinkies. Rat pinkies. Um, you know, warmed up, obviously, uh, defrosted and warmed up. And I use uh, hot air uh, humidifiers, you know, that uh, the warm, you know, it's really hot. Uh, you know, they have a water tank. I don't know if you've seen those. They're very inexpensive. Uh, and, and then I'll use tongs and go back and forth and, and try to get uh, an animal to eat. If they don't uh, take that, um, a, 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 you know, some of them will. Usually you get about a third of them the first right. night you try will, will, will eat the uh, rat right. pinkies. Right. So next uh, I'll try... Uh, mouse uh, frozen thawed uh, mouse hoppers and i'll maybe get a few more started and then uh next uh, for those holdouts uh i will try uh, uh african or um chinese dwarf hamster babies whoa 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 steve where are you getting chinese dwarf hamsters at where is that like a local plug or do you breed them what the heck I breed them. I I, uh, I I really like them. Um, wow. They I keep a colony of them. Uh, oh my gosh! How much for a colony, bro? Come on. <laughs> no, cool. you can. Hey, if you uh, stop by, you can have as many as you want. These are so cool. I it's first time hearing about these, um, but I'm curious. So, um, you know, so this is like a I want to say last resort. I would say like if 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 you're having a a stickler of a time with a emerald trying to take its first meal you'll toss in a live one of these pups or what or what would you do yeah so um uh, you know i keep a colony uh on a uh you wow. know in freedom so and their babies are well first of all uh, chinese dwarf hamsters are wonderful animals they're uh, extremely tame they're very different than uh the russian dwarf hamsters or the robos or all the different variations the right. chinese are uh good they're kind to each other where the right. rats attack anyway uh their babies are uh hot they're warm they're are these are these right am I, am I in the right area here with these chinese ones do these look familiar yeah 
This is it right here. Yeah, but uh, their their babies uh, get hair real early, and they have okay. a, a hot signature, and uh, basins seem to love them. So I, I'll put a little deli cup under uh, a baby basin that won't take a frozen thawed and leave a, uh, a live dwarf hamster in there all night. I know that the baby uh, Chinese dwarf hamster is not going to hurt the animal. They can't get to the animal. And uh, more than likely, when I uh, come down in the morning, it's gone. Wow. And it, then it's a, a pretty easy transition. Sometimes I got to go, I, I try to go right from there to... Um, a rat pinky, frozen thawed rat pinky, but sometimes I got to go to frozen thawed hamster. So there's an intermediate step, but they all come around. You know, you want these things to be eating rats. Uh, right. not, at the end of the day. At the end of the day, uh, a frozen thawed rats. And then how for for how often? How often are you feeding it? Uh, probably every ten days or so, or or two weeks. 10 days to two weeks. Is, is, that, is that depending on defecation? Yes, uh, it, it is. But I, uh, if it's their first meal, uh, 10 or, or 14 days later, uh, they may have a second meal. Uh, after the second meal, I, I, I'll definitely wait uh, for a defecation. If I've, been going, I've been going 10, 14, 10, 14. Is that okay? Like just kind of mixing it up. You know what I mean? Like don't. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Man. Listen, Steve, I love these basins. I mean, I'm only talking to you about this because you have so many. I really love these basins, Steve. Like, I'm, I, and what's crazy is like, I'm always looking for my next high. I and mean, when I say that, it's like meaning like the next animal to get me like my mojo going. And it's been basins for a long time. And since I've had basins now in my collection, it's only gotten worse. <laughs> I just, right. I, I just because, and I love my northerns. I have Miss Willie lines, I have beautiful northerns from rico wilder are you kidding me the late rico wilder rest in peace but i have a, a trio of his females from 2011 okay what a blessing um but my nicest rico wilder northern can't compare to some basins that i've seen it's there's just such a difference and, and there's nothing against northerns northerns still need to be worked with don't get me wrong but the scalation the coloration Everything in a basin is amplified. It's next level. It's nuts. I can't explain it. Like you have to have both in front of you to see what I'm talking about. You know, it, it's, but it, you know, my next topic, what I want to talk about is like the pricing of basins, you know, because basins, man, as much as everyone loves them. And here's the thing. I feel like a lot of people might be good. For, I mean, I feel like some people are, could be good with basins. They probably could understand what to do with them, but do they got, do they got the, they got the cheddar, you know, it's, it's a really expensive snake to get into. You know what I mean? Um, what were basins like when you're, you know, you first getting into this, right? When you were first looking into the basins in 2007 or six or that time frame, what were they going for back then? I'm curious. Oh, uh, they were still expensive. They were uh, thousands of dollars for babies. Um, you know, and a, a really high end baby would be, Five, six, seven, ten thousand dollars. So same stuff to today. It ain't changed. So, no. so meaning, it's at where it needs to be at. There's, there's nothing wrong with the prices. Then that's where it should be at. It's where it's always been. Is what you're saying? Yeah. But they're hard to make. Um, For real, they're hard to make consistently. And and like I mentioned before, you know, some years you get. 30 babies or more and some years you get a, a half dozen you know six or seven or eight you know people ask me steve oh mj you're gonna have condos for sale no i'm not but guess what when i do they're gonna be expensive you know how much death i went through like i i think i think condos should be way more expensive i see some people you know pricing some pure locality stuff at like 1500 1700 well guess what if i had any of those pure locality stuff that i killed and they were alive we're talking 2k and up baby i don't give a shit and if you don't want it don't buy it i'll hold on to it because i love it that much 
But I, I'm not mad at basin prices. I'm not mad at brace. Like, like it's like I said, I told you what my boy Socrates and Allen went through combined. Like that's a lot. That's a big hit. Are you kidding me? Like three females, like which I'm sure you could relate. I'm assuming, right, Steve? Yeah. That's not easy to deal with. I mean, how do you deal with the loss nowadays, Steve? Let's let's be real. How does Steve Bolk deal with the loss? Let's talk about. God forbid, knock on wood. But let's talk about you come downstairs, one of your most prized possession females on the floor. How do you deal with it? Well, uh, fortunately, I hadn't have I have not had that experience for several years. God bless. Uh, but when when I did have that experience, it was you know we it kind of started off, uh, you know, over the fifteen years is let's keep it let's do what we can to keep it alive. And, and not overfeed it and so on. So after we got past that, then let's see if we can get through a breeding season with the lowered temperatures and increased humidity without somebody breaking out with a respiratory infection. So, got you know, I can speak for myself. I can't <clears throat> speak for the other breeders. Got past that, got past the respiratory problems. And then the, the next problem that uh, I had to deal with I dealt with in my collection is retained ovum. And I had a lot of those. And we tried calcium supplements. You know, I, I worked with Rico on this uh, problem and he felt that they were calcium deficient. And I, I didn't see how, you know, seeing how they're swallowing uh, whole oh, oh, Right. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, tried calcium supplements so that, um, you know, I wouldn't have any retained ovum in the gravid females that seemed to have no impact at all. And then uh, it uh, turned to hydration and the hydration has solved it. I've not seen a retained ovum for quite some time. Okay. So now we can keep them alive. We can breed them without inducing respiratory problems and we can uh, breed them and not have retained ovum. But we still occasionally get uh, stillborns, which are inexplicable, totally inexplicable. I mean, that, you know, in my view, uh, that would never happen in nature. That is, uh, you know, nature is very efficient. Uh, and, and that's a waste to, to have these uh, babies go full, basically full term, 150 or so days or more, and then be stillborn. That's not right. So we got to figure that one out. And then uh, occasionally you still get an animal that uh, slugs out. And, yeah. and what's, what's that about? I mean, you didn't introduce correctly. You didn't temperature cycle correctly. But, but let's be honest, Steve. If your female slugs out and she gets them all out, who gives a shit? That's, I, I mean, I would be like, thank God you got them all out. The whole goal is to get them out. Is that right? Yes, that, that is true. But I think we've, uh, you know, at least uh, uh, in, in my case, uh, we've moved beyond the retained ovum, which was a massive problem for me for uh, several years. And I attribute part of that to uh, having rain chambers, to utilizing rain chambers so that uh, gravid females, you know, I could put them in there and leave them in there for three or four hours. And no, and, and you watch them and it's like, it's like they just came out of the desert or something, uh, just drinking nonstop. You know, you can see them swallowing. So the next task uh, on the breeding front is to, uh, uh, you know, I don't think slugs happen out in the wild very often. Because, again, you know, um, nature is very conservative, and that's but, a waste but, but, of but nature. Nature is consistent with what nature provides. And one thing that nature gives these emeralds is a drink of water when they need it. It dumps on them. Like they, like it, like they get dumped on in the rain. I'm, I'm hearing people just like Amy who are finding these snakes so close to the water. Like there, there are like, there are just times where they, if they need a drink, God gives them water or nature, I should say, gives them water, you know, um, here we have to do the same but we have to know when that needs to happen and i don't believe in auto systems i don't believe in like you know give everything what it needs all at once no you need to be mindful you need to read your animal 
You need, you need to know, okay, this one needs a soak or this one needs a rain chamber or this one needs more than this one does. It's up to you. This whole automated system BS, I'm, I don't do that, Steve. I don't believe in it. I look at what needs what it needs as I see it. That's how it should be. Yeah, I think uh, I think hydration is a real key, and uh, you know it's a struggle here in Colorado, right, um, to uh, maintain humidity uh, in uh, not only in the snake room but also in the cages. And, and uh, the way I've done it is uh, I keep the snake room at you know seventy percent relative humidity. And then uh, I am missing the pads. I, I use um, pads for uh, incontinent adults. Right. You know, um, and, and uh, those in my breeding cages, those get misted about three times a week. Um, right. With, you know, reverse osmosis water so that the, the nozzles don't clog. So you get a consistent... Uh, you know, if you do a one minute spray. But anyway, um, I think the challenge for us basin breeders is to achieve consistency and predictability. And uh, that is what uh, I've been working towards. I mean, I am, uh, I'm from a place, like I said, Steve, where we have luxurious weather. I don't have to deal with a lot. I mean, humidity maybe, but humidity is like I could get that up in no time. Simply soak in the the puppy pad. Like it's not easy, or excuse me, it's not hard for me to figure out the humidity problem, right? But a lot of people are from places where they have to battle their their weather. Like a lot of people are from places where, you know, their weather determines on their breeding season. Um, and, and that's kind of unit. I mean, you you where you're at, it gets really really cold like it drops down pretty pretty cold where you're at right so yeah how are you determining weather drops and by how much like so obviously summertime summertime probably beautiful it's probably perfect where you're at in summertime from what i from what i could think right but let's talk about the winter right how are you making sure those temperatures are staying at night and what's like the danger zone to you i'm just curious oh uh well, the, the snake room is uh, uh, fairly consistent. The variable is in the cages. You know, I, I uh, each cage um, monitor the ambient temperature. Um, and incidentally, that uh, I measure ambient, I sample amp ambient temperature for the uh, thermostat on the opposite side of the cage from the heat panel. I'm not interested so much in the temperature under the heat panel. I'm interested in the ambient temperature of the cage. And, and the amb ambient would be what, Steve? Just curious. Well, I, I have about a 12 degree uh, nighttime drop. Uh, Tell me more. Let's talk about it. What's what's like the peak? What's the peak ambient in your room? And then what does it drop down to? Well, I, I think it's uh, more pertinent to talk about the environment in the cages. Because remember, the habitat system cages uh, have, you know, inch-thick walls uh, okay. and have air, air core, so they're very well uh, insulated. Okay. So, you know, uh, my peak temperatures, which occur in the July-August uh, ambient in my breeding cages, will be uh, 87 degrees or 88 degrees. Okay. And then... Uh, well, hold uh, on, Steve. Steve, I'm, I'm sorry, Steve. So that's obviously daytime. What is it dropping down to at night? Yeah, well, um, it, it is. There's a about a 12 degree uh, differential. Okay, so okay, so I'm trying. So 75. You're getting down to 75 at night. Yeah, and then uh, you know, towards in the uh, November, December, January time frame, my nighttime low will get down to. Uh, 70 degrees okay nice i like how you said that those are the winter drops it's not right. getting that it's not getting that cold 
whatsoever during the, the summer, correct? No. Uh, cause so, you know, in the, in the summer, you know, it, it's at, uh, you know, then uh, daytime highs will be in the 86 or so range and they'll, they'll peak, um, around 87 or 88. Now, from what I've heard from other people breeding basins or, I, I want to say it's just basins, but some are experiencing some sort of a RI each time the weather gets colder. You you don't deal with RIs every year, is that right? Like that's something you haven't dealt with in a while, or, or what's 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 what, what would be the reasoning behind someone dealing with an RI every time they drop the temperatures down to what you're talking about seventy? I'm not sure. Um, you know, since I stopped the uh, auto spraying of the animals. Uh, and focus more, you know, I do hand spray the animals uh, during uh, breeding season, uh, about three times a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and try to raise the humidity. So humidity gets amped up for sure when it comes to being them being paired up. That's like a, that's like a factor of yours. Yes. But mm -hmm. it, it also, uh, on the, uh, it, it could be that because my, uh, Temperature ch uh, changes are so gradual. You know, I don't just decide, hey, you know, we're going to go from a, a 86 degree daytime down to, uh, you know, 82 degrees or so. Now, I mean, there's people out there who bred northerns, people who bred basins, but I feel like the people who are good at breeding northerns are like, you know, like, oh, man, forget basins. And then there's people who are really good at breeding basins who aren't good at northerns, and they say, oh, my God, the northerns. Do you think there's a big difference? Like, do you, like, when it comes to breeding, when it comes to these, you know, reproducing, do you feel like there's a big difference, or are we just overthinking it? Like, what do you personally think about that, Steve? I I really don't know, you know, because I've, I, you know, I, Rico uh, dropped off a baby basin here. Or, or a baby northern here at one, at one time that I had for about three weeks. It was really a uh, mean animal. But <laughs> that's been my uh, that's been my experience with northerns. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any. I can't. I can't address that issue. I, that, that question. I just don't have any experience with northerns. I was never attracted to them. There's no such thing as a mean northern, okay? Let me tell you right now, Steve, there's no such thing as a mean northern. They don't bite. None of my, none, none of my northerns bite. I'm telling you right now. So I don't know. I, just, I don't think there's just enough people working with both. I think there's people either one-sided. Personally, I feel like. I just think that there's – I mean, I could be wrong, but is there anyone out there that you could think of who's been doing both and been doing both consistently where they could maybe touch on this subject. I'm just curious because I, I, my well, Northerns all like this. I think, uh, you know, uh, Ed had a lot of experience with Northerns and he could easily, obviously he has a lot of experience with basins. I think he could answer that question better, better than I could. I can't remember this correctly. I talked to Ed, you know, I don't want to say a lot, but we talk, you know, and, Pretty sure he told me northerns are harder than basins. I'm pretty sure that's what he said. I could go back and double check, but I'm pretty sure that's what he said. I'm pretty sure he said northerns are harder than basins. And based off what you said, he had a harder time with northerns. So that 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 would be an accurate statement, correct? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. I think uh, time will tell. I think at the end of the day, one thing I feel like that's very important with almost any species based off people that have bred like the harder species and whatnot, um, food cycling. How important has food cycling been to your success to producing basins? I, I don't think it's been a big factor. I, I think uh, raising the humidity during, uh, you know, uh, the shortened light cycle, the, um, increased humidity and the uh misting the animals you know three times or so or four times a week 
has been a bigger factor than uh, feeding. Now, I mean, I'm just saying that, like, you know, a lot of people have, uh, like, let's just say monitors. I feel, I fear a lot of the successful monitor breeders I had on have told me that what makes them successful is that period of not giving them any food. Um, and then there's a period where you amp them up with food. Is there, a, is there a time and place where you're not feeding your basins at all? Like, do you ever give them a, a dry period where there's not any food going on? Uh, yeah. I mean, during uh, breeding season, they go, they'll go a couple months or so uh, before I'll separate them and feed them. Okay. So I, I don't feed a lot during uh, breeding season. But they and like be more, they're more active if they're not full. And what would you say, like, you know, because a lot of people are probably wondering, like, you know, like, okay, like, let's just say you have a female that lays for you. Or hold on, let's not even go that far. Let's say you have a first town, the first time female that you want to pair up, right? And she's been eating really, really good for you. At what point would you calm down on the food before pairing her? Like, when, when, when does that happen? Well, I'm feeding adults um, about every six weeks. Uh, you know, uh, uh, adult females will eat about every six weeks or so. Oh. And um, as we get into, as we move into breeding season, I'll, I may slow that down to uh, a meal every two months. And I think that's helped a lot with uh, breeding success. Wow. Okay. Now your males, as far as your males shutting off food, how many of your males that you're pairing up shut off food? None of them. I'm glad you said uh, that. Yeah, I've never experienced that, uh, that a male refused food. You know, I've had some people tell me like, oh, that's a good sign, you know, but I've also heard that with ball pythons, but I've had one of my best males do the best work for me that's never shut off food. He's eight throughout the whole year. So I think it really determines on the, on the snake, you know? Yeah. But I, I, I think that uh, it, it's important um, to raise a male and a female differently. You know, the, the babies uh, uh, to, to try to keep the males super lean. You know, they, uh, they don't need to be big. Right. Do you have any big males? I used to. I mean, I've thinned them down. So I've any big, any big male that you had, you thinned down is what you're saying? Yeah. Hmm. I've got uh, one male that oh, – I've got two males. Um, one that I got as a baby from Nikolai, it's, you know, like, 15, 16, 17 years old, well, about 16 years old, that used to be huge. And, uh, I, you know, I realized years ago that he was, he was just too big to be an effective breeder. So I uh, put him on a diet. And now he's uh, about half the size in girth as he was. And he's, he's done an excellent job of breeding. I'm kind of concerned because I have a male. His name's Bobby Digital. He's probably like 10 plus years old. He's old for sure, but he came in big. I got him pretty big, you know, but I feed him like once a month at the most, you know, like he, this is what he's been on, but he stayed big. I don't know what he's going to do. I have no clue. Like, I don't, you know, but I guess time will tell, right? Yeah. And I, I would, uh, you're not, are you feeding him? What size prey are you feeding him? Probably something like a big size, small, maybe like, I mean, nothing. I don't, I mean, I, I had just because I've been feeding him on the smaller side, like I, I purposely has been feeding him less this year. Like I knew I was going to breed and I knew he was big. So I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to feed him. Like he does, he's big already. You know what I mean? So I've been feeding him like on the smaller side, but because of that, and I know I'm going to like right now, like what you're saying right now, my females are good. They're not going to be eating for the next couple months. They're, they're chilling out. They're chilling out at this point because they're big. They're all, they're all going into their first time breeding this year, and they're all big. I mean, you could see none of these are bred, and they're fucking big, you know. So, 
I'm getting ready for things right now, Steve. I'm not playing around. I'm not playing around. You know what I mean? But I also have my males who've been eating beastly too. So one of my elder males right here, who's been in my care for about four years and he came in pretty old already. Um, I'm kind of, I don't want to say I've been thinning him out, thinning him out all, all year, but I've been making sure that he's on a proper diet. Now I can tell you right now, he's Mr. All about rope. Like he's roaming everywhere. Like he's acting a little different. He used to be Mr. Perched up and doing his thing. But now at night we've had a little slight of a temperature drop and this guy is active at night. Is that something that you've seen when males, like do yeah. you see them? Okay. That's a really good sign. Okay. All right. You know, at that point, when you see signs like that, do you pair them up or do you, just, do you, do you wait a little bit? Like, what, what what would you do in this case? I would wait because um, okay. they burn out early in the uh, breeding. But, you know, that, that's something that we don't know. I mean, right. Uh, I usually uh, pair up around Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah. But okay. some people wait longer. And maybe it makes a difference. Maybe it doesn't. Um, but I think it depends on. It obviously depends where you're at. You know, like let's think about the East Coast. They they get hit with a cold front a lot a lot quicker than we do, right? Yeah. That's why a lot of people need to figure out and talk to people on on who's like who where you at. Like it depends where you're at. It really does. I feel like. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but usually uh, here in Colorado, you know, we will usually have our first snowfall uh, by Thanksgiving. Not always, but frequently. And you, is that what you go by, Steve? That snowfall? Or is that like your? Is that your like your indicator right then and there? Like it's 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 pair up time. Yeah, but uh, it it may be um, in that Thanksgiving time frame. If I see a male that's super active at night. And it's really cruising. Let me introduce him. We've talked a lot about goods and bads with working with what you work with. Let's talk about a little bit more bad, if you don't mind. <laughs> Let's talk about prolapses. Have you ever dealt with prolapses at all, uh, Steve? Oh, yeah. Uh, I have, uh, you know, especially on the animal, you know, the babies that I raised years ago and raised them on too large of a perch and consequently had a tail kink, which oftentimes leads to a, a prolapse. Now, do you feel like that's less effective to an adult? Like it's adult, they could be fine with big, small, medium perches, but smaller ones need a certain size perch is what you're saying. Yeah, it was interesting because, um, again, there wasn't much information uh, 10 or so years ago, it turns out that if you raise a baby, on, and I was raising babies just on a doll rod that was too large diameter, that the, the tail kink really didn't show up until two or three years, until they were like three years old. So you didn't realize the damage that you've done. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I uh, keep things on uh, really uh, thin, small, thin perches. And you keep them over water or do you keep them uh, on a paper towel? No. What do you like to keep them over? No, they're uh, in uh, those uh, cam uh, Rubbermaid polycarbonate. Over boxes. water? Uh, no, but they have uh, little uh, deli cups of water. What do you think about keeping any arboreal baby snake over water? I, I think it's problematic uh, because I think I, I don't think there's any way to keep it clean. Mm, true. And also, um, yes, you find Amazon basins around the uh, Amazon Basin River. I don't think that they're necessarily coming down and drinking out of the river. They don't need to. Why would they? Yeah. They get uh, fresh rain uh, every day. In, you've probably seen this with your animals where, um, well, maybe not, but w with my uh, setup, when the pads are misted, you know, uh, three times a week, there's yeah. big water droplets on the pads, and I see the animals 
uh, reaching down and sucking up the water droplets. I haven't seen that. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I, I frequently see it. So it's pretty obvious to me that after a rain, it's fresh water. Uh, you know, there's going to be crevices in the in the tree, uh, in the trees up in the uh, canopy that they're going to drink out of. You want to know one thing that I paid, and not not babies, but one thing to my adults that I pay close attention to is, let's say there's a, a podcast I go do, or you know, for instance, Tinley. I've been gone for I was gone for about five days, right, from Tinley. Um, I came back and did. First thing, first room I changed water in was this room. Mind you, my caretaker was in this room about two days prior to me getting home. So they probably went about two days without fresh water, I would say. I gave them, I gave them fresh water, and I shit you not, even though it was daytime, they were down there drinking water. For whatever reason, snakes know when there's fresh water in their enclosure. Definitely. Like Definitely. they know. Like they especially if they're thirsty. Like if right. they're thirsty, they're like, oh my God, thank God. Like they just, it's crazy, Steve. Like they know. And I'm not just talking about emeralds. I'm talking about chondros. Everything you see in here, like they know when there's fresh water, you know? And that's why I'm also, you know, like I said, I'll go no more than three days, you know? But I feel like there's a certain point in time where some of these snakes know that they got shit water. Some of them don't, but some of them know that like, I'm not going to drink that shit. Like, I feel like some of them are like so like mine are so pampered where they're like, I'm going to wait for fresh water. And it's funny because once I give them fresh water, Steve, what do you think is happening an hour after I leave the room straight down? They're all straight down drinking water. And you know, you know, I paid close attention to this because there's people out there who, for whatever reason said, you know, they don't drink out of water bowls. You have to spray them. Like the only way they drink is if you spray them. Well, that's bullshit. Bull, bull crap. Excuse me. I'm so sorry little Connor and Skyler out there listening. I'm so sorry. I'm just saying that's, that's poo. Okay. Cause I seen every single one of these go down, not only drink a big gulp of water, but dude, have you seen this, Steve? They swim, they swim in the water bowl. They're like, they're like loving it. Like, have you ever seen that before? Or am I, or am I tripping? Have you ever seen their head just go into the water bowl and they're just like swimming in it? Have you ever seen that before? No, I, I I've not experienced that, but I've, I have elevated bowls, so their their uh, bowls are right, right. R right next to their perch. But I, I, let me um, show you one of these uh, perches that I'm keeping these babies on. Yeah, please do. I, I, I'll, I'll just uh, walk over here and grab it. Okay, now take your time. Take your time, guys. Why Steve's doing that? Are you having a great time? We're about two hours deep. Let's get the likes up. Let's get the likes up. Why is Gary Shabino and Calvin Little Free Hole? The only super chats, guys. I do this for a full time. Yeah, I'm sponsored, but still, I need burritos. I need to eat. Hello, get the super chats up, Andrew. Andrew Redwood, I need a super chat from you. I'm not gonna lie, I need a super chat from you. Seriously, it's about your, it's about your daughter. It's about her future. Give her a super chat right now, right now, Andrew Redwood. I'm calling him out. Andrew Redwood once said that Canova had rusty. Freedom Breeder Racks, and I proved that to be wrong. Andrew, should I keep going, or are you going to dro drop a super chat? Drop it. Calvin, drop a super chat for Andrew, and I'll stop roasting Andrew right now. That's what it's going to take. I, okay, here we go. Come on. Give me a $1.99, Andrew, or this will keep going. I, I feel like Steve doesn't even know what perch he wants to pull out yet, so I could keep going. I need a super chat from you, my guy. Okay, you want to know also what Andrew? Okay, I'll I'll continue on Andrew. All right, what do we got here, Steve? Well, here's a, a baby that was born about eight days ago. Uh, actually, born right before Tinley. Um, wow. Okay, I'm gonna put you on the main screen. Go ahead and keep talking, Steve. Okay. So you can see the uh, size of perch. These are these little uh, kitchen helpers. Very inexpensive. And uh, these are this is just an ideal perch. Really is. Uh, let me uh, switch this light. Maybe is that better? Yeah, that that's better. I could actually see more. Yeah. So this little guy has not had his first shed yet. 
Where'd you get that? Where'd you get those purchases from there, uh, Steve? Oh, they're just at the hardware store. You can get them at, you know, Target or whatever. And basically what you do is you just cut out um, a few of these things so that, you know, it's uh, so there's lots of area. And, and I'll keep them on this for uh, almost the first year. This wow. is a, a nice little baby. So I'm waiting for this guy to have his first shed and then I'll try to feed him. So this one is freshly from, you said it was born just before Tinley, you said. Yeah, uh, uh, I was born on the 4th. How many, how many were you, uh, is, is that from what's inside, uh, this, I'm assuming this is what the thumbnail is from. This is what the picture from is from the thumbnail. This is your, your, your litter count here. Oh yeah. It's one of those. Sure. How many? Oh, there were seven in this litter. Uh, seven live one, one still. How many are you keeping Steve? Don't lie to me. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, before Gary, because you know, I understand. I feel like here's the thing with Gary. You know what Gary does that I do? Stays on the top of all his friends' list. That's what I do. Okay, Steve, I'm not. I don't play. Like when my buddies, like you, produce something so legendary, and my buddies like you want to go ahead and let something go. Gary's one of those first people that get approached. Am I wrong? Or am I right? Like, do you like do you like letting Gary know when you're getting rid of something? Sure. Because it's Gary. It's going to Gary Shabino. Are you kidding me? It's going to the right person. I want to be that guy it's someday at some point. I want to, like, people go to Gary. Like, that's the thing. Um, Steve, listen, Gary's okay. I just got to say, if it comes down to you letting go of anything, I just want to let you know that there's other younger versions of Gary out there who really look up to you. And I feel like you should maybe consider them. Maybe just let them know that you have something available. And maybe Gary won't be so overwhelmed, overwhelmed with just taking all your heat. Maybe Gary's happy that I'm telling you this right now. I don't know. I could be out of line. I'm just, you know, do you blame me, Steve? I'm just trying, Steve. I'm trying. I hear you. Let Thank you. Let me put go this ahead, guy go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead and put it back. God damn it. Gary Shavino, I envy you, my man. Because you know damn well, whatever's available out of this right here, whatever's available right here to the right, Gary Shavino gets first dibs. Yeah, it's the truth. First dibs. Gary Shavino should be called guaranteed satisfied. This should be his, it should be GS. That should be GS. Guaranteed satisfied. That's That should be what GS should stand for. <sighs> Gary, it's all good. Ship it to Gary. Wow, look what we got. We got, hold on. Okay. Oh, wow. What? $4.99. Jesse Morgan. I feel you on that. Oh my God, we have another four ninety nine. Leave him alone and get a salad, MJ. You know what, Calvin? I don't appreciate that, but I also know that you are most, if not all, the way autistic. So that's fine. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see, Andrew. Oh, we, here we go, Andrew. Twenty bucks. I appreciate it. All right, listen. Here, I got to ask you, Steve. A lot of people are asking about the Black Basin project which is basically glorified on my thumbnail. Got to say, one-of-a-kind snake. What's the deal with this project? What's happening with this right now? Well, I, I've been uh, breeding uh, F2s uh, from the, uh, you know, from your picture is uh, Abby. Okay. And I, I've I got lots of uh, animals that are out of the black line, but they're not turning black. And uh, I'm just not sure about the genetics. Now I want to talk a little bit more about that. So you, you've you been able to per, per, reproduce from this black-looking emerald, but nothing's turning black is what you're saying. Yes, and I've taken uh, her babies and uh, bred them, um, uh, you know, to each, uh, you know, line bred them. And Nothing. not, yeah, not, they're green. And I really... I uh, love the black basins. I think they're astounding. But they're, uh, they're, more, they're more likely a shoe in. Like it's something seems to be more like a, like a, like a, almost a one-off, right? I mean, how many black basins are out there? There's not a lot. Like if not any, like it's, it's crazy. No, they don't uh, show up too often. So, um, 
yeah, I, I mean, it's just going to take time, I guess. Now, I mean, where were you at with, you know, I know you're saying that you're making siblings or, you know, you're making actually children from this original Black Basin, but how far are we from them actually producing? Where are we at with this, uh, their generation of actually starting to uh, start fulfilling projects here? Uh, I, so I have, um, I've, uh, the siblings I've bred to each other and uh, they produce uh, green animals. Uh, I, I guarantee that's not Amy. I'm going to say, let me see, who is it this time? There has to be a, a, a person that we know, Steve, that's interrupting you. And I'm just taking notes. Amy is a one-off. Amy, okay, who is that again? Here we go. Who is it, Steve? <laughs> Who's bothering you right now, Steve, just so I know? Uh, it's museum business. Okay, never mind. I give it to the shout out to museum business. Wait, okay, can we take a break here? We've been listen, we've been geeking out about snakes the whole time, but I got some real deal car lovers in the house. Like I got people wanting to hear about what's the relationship between you and a cobra. <laughs> Dude, can we, okay, intermission time. Let's talk about the cars. I have to talk like what's your relationship between you and cars, Steve? Please. Well, um, I've been uh, collecting and racing uh, Cobras and, and GT40s and uh, became, in the 80s, became really close friends with Carol Shelby. Wow. And um, I, I am one of the founders. There's a group of us that we founded the Shelby American Collection Car Museum in, in Boulder, Colorado. And... Um, it's I'm the executive director and it's the finest collection of Shelby race cars in the world. And, you know, it's full of uh, Cobras and uh, GT forties. Well, I mean, did you see Ford versus Ferrari? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have the, uh, the actual car that Ken miles drove at the 66 Le Mans and won. Um, and then we wow. have, yeah. So we have the very first Cobra in the museum um, we have the, uh, we have a Dayton, one of the six Daytona coupes and, uh, a Cobra Roadster that won the world manufacturers championship in 1965. So we got a lot of really cool stuff. Amy's been with, uh, Larry. Listen, if you want to talk about reptiles, I get it. That's one thing, but we're talking cars here. Cars has been sought after for years. I'm talking about like if it's a guy's thing to be in, no disrespect to the women. I know there's women into cars, but that's a guy's thing to really have a niche in is that the cars like are, I, I'm almost intimidated by people who are into cars because how much knowledge goes behind all of that, you know? And I mean, what was it, Steve? You, I mean, you've been a, a boy into cars. Like, I mean, what, what was it that made you even tap into this? Like, I know the snakes are one thing, and I love the story behind that, but we're talking about a whole other piece of history here. And again, I've been drinking some alcohol after to urinate. You won't hear me, but I can hear you. So go ahead and tell me this. I got to hear this. <laughs> okay. Jeez. Um, yeah, I, I started uh, collecting and uh, racing. Uh, 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 my racing career started uh, with Ferrari, and then I, I switched to uh, Cobras in the uh, 80s and raced Cobras and GT40s uh, in the U.S. and Europe. And uh, along the way, became good friends with Carol Shelby and uh, created this museum in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, every year we'd have... Uh, Carol would come and Bob Bondurant and Dan Gurney and Phil Hill and all the guys would, uh, would when they were alive, would come to our museum for our annual events. Now, you said annual events. I heard there's a California event that your, one of your cars won the, the prize in. Is, 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 I think it's a Pebble Beach event. Am I wrong? I can't remember. Can you remind me? Yeah, uh, there's a... Uh, now that's a, a a car show. That's not a race. There's the Pebble Beach Concorde de Elegance, right? And it's uh, it, it's invitation only. And uh, yeah, one of my cars uh, was invited. 
and uh, won the show. <laughs> First uh, in class, and then it won overall for uh, post-war preservation. Why am I so more happy than you are right now? <laughs> Steve, like, I feel like you're just not impressed by that. Like, how, like, what is it that you have done that you're very proud of? Like, I mean, not that you're not proud of that. Don't get me wrong. But, I mean, you know, being a Thrant... Uh, my God, Thrant, Thrantopolis. Did I say that right? I, I just butchered that right right now. God dang it. I just practiced this, practiced this forever. Throw yeah. amp... Okay, you know what I'm saying. Okay, I'm talking about that field of what you're into. When did this happen? I'm, I'm curious because I'm all about trying to be the you know i want to help people at some point in my life and i feel like that's a huge part of what you do you're all about giving back steve am i right yeah that that's a, a very important thing to me uh we uh you know i started a company in 2017 uh called tapcat t-a-p-k-a-t and it is a, a SaaS that that is software as a service uh, so, yeah, you can see the site at tapcat.com, and it raises um, its online sweepstakes for nonprofits. And we raise millions of dollars every quarter for nonprofits like uh, Ronald McDonald House, United Way, and we do the uh, Chip Miller Amelodosis Foundation, you know, for blood cancer, and we do Team Jack for pediatric brain cancer, and uh, American Cancer Society, you know, we, we do them all. And actually, we did a, um, a sweepstakes for ARC, for U.S. ARC. I don't know if you remember. I did not know that. Yeah. Um, Michael Cole uh, donated a, a pair of Boland's Pythons. Uh, wow. And, what, what show was this? It wasn't a show. It was just an online oh. sweepstakes. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. And so it raised uh, $50,000 for U.S. ARC. And we were planning on doing more, but, uh, you know, some folks were complaining that uh, live animals were a sweepstakes prize. Hmm. Um, so felt it was uh, exploiting animals. So we, but we had planned to do a whole series of these for U.S. ARC. Right. But now, for the most part, and this is, do, do I have the right website? I want to make sure yeah. I have the right thing up. So now, what it is, it's mainly cars that you guys sweepstakes. Is that correct? No, we do. Uh, if you click on the uh, sweepstakes tab, you can see, or, or scroll down, uh, you'll oh, see wow. some. Yeah. Oh, wow. This is cool. Like all, a, all, all, all by all by donating is what you're saying. This is what you could win. Yeah, like uh, if you click on that, uh, go back up to the red Shelby Mustang. Uh, right here. Yeah, so click on that. And uh, that raised a million and a half last uh, few years back. So you can see on the top left, you can see how much it raised. Uh, that raised it for um, the Shelby American Collection, my car museum, which uh, is a nonprofit too. So, so cool. yeah, I mean, this is a way, uh, not so much for my car museum, but for uh, pediatric brain cancer and different blood cancers. Or we do um, JDRF, you know, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. Wow, that's amazing! Like all, like everything that this world needs is what you is what all this money is contributing to. Yes. Like you want to talk about being a leader? Like, I, like here I am trying to focus on just staying a leader in the industry. You're a leader in the world, Steve. Like, are you kidding me? This is nuts. This is amazing. Like, this is. I hope I could have some sort of effect on this, in the world like this. This is crazy. What inspired do you want to do? I mean, like, it's so easy to be a selfish pig. You know that, right? I mean, obviously, you probably have a, you probably know how easy that could be to just want to keep things for yourself. But what made you to want to be this way, Steve? I'm curious. Uh, I, I've, uh, I just wanted to do it. Um, and initially did it out of uh, necessity for our car museum. You know, uh, Carol Shelby passed away in 2012 
Yeah. And uh, we needed a, and we used to keep that the museum going by these galas. You know, people would come and he would sign autographs and stuff. Like that. So um, we started doing these uh, sweepstakes, uh, these car giveaways at the museum. They were so successful that we had nonprofits all around the country wanting to use the software. So we um, revised the software into a, a SaaS company, you know, software as a service. So that we, and we do, uh, you know, we do a lot of stuff for Ford, um, uh, the Ford Foundation. We do the uh, National Sprint Car Hall of Fame and the Auburn Cord Duesenberg Museum, the Cobra Experience and the Owl's Head um, uh, Transportation Museum. We even do one for Gary. We do the uh, Saratoga Automobile Museum. That's for you, Gary. <laughs> I mean, if it's one thing I'm starting to take a, a notice of is, you know, not only do the people I look up to in this game are working with the right stuff, but they hang around with the right stuff. And what I mean is you are who you hang, you are who you hang around with, Steve. And I pay close attention to that. I pay close to people, I pay close attention to that. I, I look up to that, who they keep their surroundings with. And um, if it's one thing about Gary, man, as much as I love Gary, his friends, are just as cool, if not cooler, than he is. And that's what I have to give it to Gary about, man. That's what Gary does. Gary Gary stays on top of things. I will tell you that right now. Um, I haven't asked you this, but how far back do you and Gary go? Um, I guess we've known each other for a couple of years. Um, he is an amazing guy. And I'm really uh, proud uh, to be one of his friends. I mean, it's Gary somebody to where you, you want to talk about proud being his friends. Like the fact that I traveled with him multiple times, you know, it, it I, I feel very personal to Gary, you know, but because of that, Gary has told me a lot of influential things about what I'm doing with this podcast, but it also like gave me like, you know, stepping, stepping stones to things I want to accomplish. You know, having you on this show is a huge accomplishment, you know, to have somebody with your experience kind of talk about what it is that you've done that I'm looking to do at some point a big deal to me you know and i have to owe it all to people like gary who've uh, able to make me do things like this and make things like this happen um but my thing with you uh, my thing in general steve uh, and i'm sure you could probably relate to this is as you kind of progress and you move on with your collection you kind of get careful with who you share information with am i right or wrong or, or, or are you somebody to share all your information with and i don't have to talk about today but let's talk about pre-social media like let's talk about how things were when i don't know let's be real not everybody is meant to get along with everybody not it i mean there's not everyone that you like that are still around like let's just let's just talk about some real emotional feelings here you know like i, I mean is there there was there a certain point in time where you were careful with information that you let out because you knew that you know, you, you just want to keep it into the right hands or I'm just curious. I, I, no, I, I've never had that attitude. I, um, I, I used to be a lot better on uh, answering the uh, email questions that would come through my website. And I've, get, I've gotten behind on that because I've been so busy, but uh, no, I'll tell anybody anything, you know, that I think will help them. Uh, especially when it comes to breeding, uh, basins you know which is is um my passion it's one of my passions let's talk about the average dollar amount like i mean we're talking about obviously what the higher end basin would go for back in your day and what it still goes for today but let's talk about your average dollar amount what is spent to purchase one of your basins um for well, it, that go yeah ahead. it's broad um you know that it's in the eighteen hundred dollar range up to twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Is uh, what I've been selling animals, but I'm not really all about um, selling animals. That's not a, a motivator. I, I want I want to finish the process. Uh, I, I also love to produce black basins, uh, but aside from that, um, I want to see a consistent 
process because these are really spectacular animals. And I, I think, you know, we should try and make more of them so that more people can enjoy them. And, and actually it doesn't uh, bother me so much that, uh, you know, they're expensive because I also want people that uh, buy these animals to really take care of them and to treasure them and to, and, and I've, I've put a ton of, I don't know if you've looked at my website, but I've, I've tried to put a, uh, a lot of information on there uh, to help folks out, uh, to make them successful. And I'm also very careful uh, not to release an animal uh, until it's consistently eating frozen thawed rat uh, or, or fuzzies. So that the you know my customer has a really good experience is not struggling, but you know so but also and I, and the other thing I do when I do sell an animal is I make sure that um, the customer ha has a complete setup and the, the you know I ask for pictures of the setup and I want to see the setup running for you know, maybe a, a couple months. So it's stable. It's a, a, a known stable environment. You know, just like anything else, right? You know, some people take longer than others to try to pick up on things, you know, and I'm curious if there was anybody out there who had a harder time than others that you really had to like spend a lot of time with, you know, especially with basins, you know, somebody spends this kind of money. Yeah, you should do, as, as a breeder and a seller, you should do your due diligence to make sure who you're selling this animal to knows what the hell they're doing. Right. But sometimes even though they sell themselves to be this person who knows what they're doing, they don't know what they're doing. You know um, how much time have you actually spent with people and, and, and literally like giving them the time, the day to the point where you're like, I don't think you're meant for this. And even maybe taking the animal back. Have you ever had to deal with that? Uh, no, I, I haven't uh, fortunately, but it may be because uh, like that baby, I just showed you, um, that won't be ready for uh, release if, if I do release it until March or April next year. Uh, because I want to make sure that it's perfect, obviously. Yeah, and that so that that customer has a, a, a very positive experience. And here's the thing, like even working with ball pythons, I know that there's just people who just don't get it, Steve. Like there's just some people who just like, they, they just don't get it. And what I mean by that is you, you got to understand when there's time to give your snake heat, when not to give your snake heat, right? There's, there's no one or way, right? There's no one or right way to do things. It depends where you live, like I'm saying, right? But it really depends on the keeper to figure that out. And some people just don't know how to connect the dots when it comes to certain things like that. And I could give you one of many examples. Um, and, and this is just in the ball python game. And if, I, if it's one thing that's motivating me to want to breed something that is really difficult to breed. And mind you, if I ever get good at breeding of the, any of this stuff, I'm not looking to do 10 or 20 litters or clutches. No, not at all. I'm looking to have stuff that will aid me to get that will be able to get me to get anything else I want out there. And some of the most some of the people I look up to highly in the chondro game and animal game are simply breeding animals to simply trade to get what they want. And that's how I look at this stuff. Like I don't want my productions going to morph market. I, and I'm talking about this stuff. Like I don't, I don't want to have to sell to the general public. This stuff means too much to me. It really does. And what I've had to deal with, with ball Python customers, it scares me. It really scares me on what I'm facing. If it ever comes down to me having to sell chondros or emeralds to the general public i don't ever want that steve i don't yeah i can i can relate to that what what was your impression of the show boy uh, uh, you know we just got back from tinley i mean it's a ball python fest it's 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 i mean i didn't go to tinley to look at the animals i'll tell you that much <laughs> like i went to tinley because i knew gary shavino greg maxwell steve boltz I knew there was people that were going to be there that I want to meet. That's why I go to Tinley. I don't go to Tinley for the animals. Um, don't, I mean, don't get me wrong. Cold Blooded Cafe was in the building. They had some amazing scrubs. They had some Neos. 
Nobody had emeralds. I mean, there were maybe some captain born and bred, or no, excuse me, not captain born, but some fresh imports that had crypto written all over them. Like you could see the bones. I'm okay. Yeah. I don't. I don't want any of that. You know. Unfortunately, there's no Rico Wilders at these shows. There's nobody that's displaying something for me, people like you and I, to go to to look at. Unfortunately, it's not. That's not the case. It's sad, but it's the truth. Yeah, the, the uh, ball python marketplace is so um, paradox. Does it bother you though? I mean, let me ask you this: like, the, I got some, I got some emerald tree boa breeders. So I, I can't just throw them under the bus. So there's, there's more than emerald tree boa breeders out there. But I have some people that are in the arboreal game that just they can't stand to see me making a seven thousand, eight thousand dollars sale on a ball python. They hate it. They don't like it. But what? Oh well. What does that? What does that? What does that really mean to you, Steve? If you see somebody like myself creating a morph, making thousands of dollars off of it, what does that do to you? Or does it not do anything to you? Oh no, I, I just uh, I have a keen interest in, in business, and I'm I'm just wondering how this is all going to turn out. <laughs> turn out meaning how, like 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 meaning is this a hoax? Like is this is this just something that's just like peaking to what it's supposed to be and then it's going to crumble or what do you mean by that oh uh for instance when we had dinner uh and marshall was talking about uh you know he's creating some incredible morphs right, right. Uh, it's hard for me to follow the genetics you know when you start stacking uh, right yeah so i i just wonder if I mean, 10 or 20 years from now, if a normal ball python could be the super valuable thing. Like if it's going to do the whole 180, like, like, like whatever the most rarest thing is, like if you go have, if you have a classic, you're ahead of the game is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, uh, let me uh, give you an analogy. Um, we've seen it in the car marketplace. It used to be that, uh, you know, for the, uh, for a lot of the cars, the restoration was, you know, they had to be restored and they had to be absolutely perfect, especially for some of the uh, international shows. And now the, the trend is back to original, you know, survivors, you know, uh, cars that, uh, and the, actually the one that um, I have that one Pebble Beach, the Concorde de Elegance um, is all original even down to its tires from the last race in Europe. Um, and in the past, something like that would be completely restored. But now the interest is uh, back to originality. So if you can uh, find a, a, an original vehicle, you know, it's had long-term ownership and has not been restored, that carries more value. And I just wonder if on retics and ball pythons if that if we may see that in years to come i mean i'm not uh, a, a hybrid guy you know i, right. I would cross a basin with a northern and you can argue wait wait wait, wait 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 hold on gary told me you were just invested as in into carpondros as you were in the basins is that a lie <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, Gary Shabino's punching the air right now. He's like, "Damn you, MJ!" Oh, he hates his Carpondros. Guy, do you think it's excessive though? Like, he really hates Carpondros. Like, he does not like them. Are you on that level, uh, Steve? With no. Carpondros? No, and, and, and I mean the same as again using the the car analogy. On the <laughs> there's um, you know, there, there's all those Cobra replicas out there, right? You know, some of the guys uh, hate the replicas. I, I, I think they're fine. I mean, not everybody can afford uh, a real Cobra. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, so I, I'm okay with uh, the hybrids, but, but I, I don't. I would never make any myself. I think that's Gary thinking like, I don't know. Not everyone could afford a basin. It's okay with a mix of 50-50 if she could do it. <laughs> Let me ask you this though: what, what, What's your opinion with the fifty with the crosses, the northern going into basins? How, how do you feel about those? I don't like them. 
You don't like them. Okay, respect. Yeah, but, I mean, they don't uh, get me going like with Gary and the uh, Car Carpanos. Uh, <laughs> I can't even say them. I don't. I don't blame you. It's okay. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know what's funny is you know my very first basin that I got my hands on is a is a diamond lined slash. It was a diamond six to dark knight and merino line. And I was really happy to show Ed. I'm like, Ed, I got one of your basins, man. Like, I can't believe it. He's like, but do me a favor, please. Do not breathe that to any northern whatever you do. I'm asking you to do me this favor. And, you know, Ed never asks me for anything, right? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> sure, no problem. And, I, and you, you don't think I wanted to breathe it to a northern? I'm, that's the first thing I'm thinking about. But I got to respect, you know, in my eyes, Ed's the king of basins. Well, where I, how I'm growing up, Ed is my king when it comes to basins. So I am not going to go against what this guy has to say when it comes to that. So I had to ask you on what your thoughts are. Not that you would ever tell your customer, hey, don't breed your male basin to a northern. But, I mean, the, purif the, purif the purification of these basins really do matter to you, right? Oh, yeah, they, uh, very much so. And, and I agree with Ed's position. You know, he's, he, um, <laughs> I think his diamonds are, are the very best thing he produces, and he worked very, very hard at them, very selective breeding, uh, and, and did a spectacular job. And, and I would hate to see one of his um, diamonds, diamond basins, being bred to a northern. Now, we were talking about how, like, the, the, the dark stuff is being really hard for you to prove out, right? But it seems like Ed is able to put the high white, like the snowflake to snowflake and create more snowflakes, right? Right. Um, have you been seeing that with your stuff? Like, have you been able to produce the high white stuff to other high white stuff and getting oh. high white stuff? Is that is that the norm for you? Yes, very much so. Very predictable. It, and, and the blocks are just not turning out that way. I mean, there's been, you know, some speculation that it, it may be the environment that they're raised in i mean there, there may be other factors other than genetic on the on the black basins i could be i could be totally wrong but i've had three northerns to prove this theory correct so far and i'm talking about i've given my northerns straight ambient lighting meaning they were in a tub like they're in a a, a sterilite tub meaning that's the kind of lighting they got into one of these and i started giving them some of this led lighting and they became very dark like i'm talking about they became dark like i was like whoa so i don't i'm not saying that's the case but i feel like this kind of lighting that some of them get from what i've seen at a certain age when it goes to one point to the next it could just be an age thing too i could be completely wrong but i'm noticing that i from what i've seen any kind of snake going from Okay, that's a cool color change to holy shit. When did you become black? It's because of like light exposure. Have you noticed that? Or am I, I mean, I, I'm just just curious. No, I haven't noticed that. And, I, and I've uh, over the years gone from fluorescent to compact fluorescent to now everything's LED. Yeah. But the, I, I will say this that um, the basins no. get much prettier uh, as they get older, they get richer. The white holds. They're not like a, your ball, your seven thousand dollar ball python morph. <laughs> it's worse as it gets older. No, oh, but Steve, hold on. Okay, listen. You got an old mindset right there. Not that I, I'm not trying to call you old, but I'm just saying the mindset is not up to date because now there's these recessive genetics. Like ball pythons leaning to a place where the older it gets, the better looking it gets. It's starting to change. Trust me. Ball pythons, I I know what you're talking about. I've seen it. I've seen a ball python look the best fresh after its first shed. And then after its first year, it's like, what happened to that snake? Everything's gone. But my friend, I'm telling you, there's these new genetics that are making these snakes more relevant than ever when it comes to age. So be ready for it, I will say. Okay, I'll, I'll get ready for it. <laughs> Are you are you saying you're getting ready? Like, you're, are we willing to trade? Can I give you some ball pythons for some? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the day. Um, I, I, okay, listen, I have a wrap up question for you before we get into some hot seat questions here, Steve. Um, 
anyone out there who's avoiding diversity. And what I mean by that is, you know, I give props to any ball python breeder who's successful out there. Good for you. Especially if you've been doing it for 20 plus years. I'm happy for you, right? But it's not a good place to be complacent. And I feel like ball python breeding for so long can make you complacent. Like, like what? where's the challenge at? Do you recommend diversity out there for anyone out there new coming into this? And they're, they're like me, fired up. They want to get in everything, but they're scared to because what they hear. For somebody who's been in the game as long as you have, what's your recommendation when it comes to diversity as far as keeping and breeding goes? Uh, I, I would keep what you love, what you're passionate about. And uh, if your goal is to, uh, to breed, to never give up. Never give up. Yeah. That's one thing that uh, Carol Shelby always said. That, uh, and it worked for him. I mean, he won, won the Maw as a driver and won the World Manufacturers Championship. Uh, and he had some really tough times. Too. So uh, keep yeah. what you love and, and that you have a lot of passion about. And if your intent is to breed, uh, keep at it, never give up, and you'll get it done. I mean, this world is so developed nowadays on how to avoid any tough times. Like it's like it's like these people are being created to become so soft. And to become so like, like anti, like dealing with life. But at the end of the day, Steve, you can't avoid life. You can't. I don't give a shit how careful you are. I don't care who your friends are. I don't care that you do less activity. What are you going to do when shit happens and hits you in the face? You have to deal with it. You have to figure it out. And if it's one thing about this Emerald Tree Boa game, Chondro game, that's it. It's going to hit you with life super hard. Yeah, that's what it, I want. That's right. Uh, I mean, the the ball python stuff is like almost instant gratification, right? Instant. It's it's too easy. It's it, it, but here's the thing. It, it it makes me want other ball python breeders to realize, bro, do more. Trust me. Like if you're able to get this down and make a living off of it, there's a lot more that we could get our hands on to make this industry bigger. Like it's not about making the like. It, here's the thing. We have to create our own challenges, Steve. I have a feeling like you're good at creating challenges for yourself to make almost anything that happens to you in life doable. You have to make challenges for yourself. I agree. And you know, people who avoid the easy way, you know, excuse me, people who approach the easy way in life and looking to take shortcuts. That's one thing I love about this game. And, you know, we're talking about the ball python, ball python games where I don't want to say you could get rid of or you could do shortcuts, but you could almost get away with it in a sense. This stuff, you can't. You try to do shortcuts with this stuff. Watch what happens. And, and you know, and, and listen, I'm in this to keep things alive, Steve. I'm not in this to get, you know, a litter or a clutch and say yeah i did it no my biggest goal after this mom lays a litter or a clutch is to make sure she's alive still that's my biggest goal that's all i want you know i'm not in here to sacrifice snakes to keep producing in fact if my snakes keep dying after i produce i probably won't even want to produce i don't want to do that you know what i'm saying um but at the end of the day i i just i i don't know steve i i just feel like uh i'm very happy to be where i'm at but I know that I'm at because of the animals. So I want to do right by the animals, but I also want to challenge myself and, and make sure that I'm, I'm also deserving with what I have. I feel like a lot of people are just, you know, they know with what they have and they're cool with it. For me, like, you know, having you on this show makes me so happy because of what I'm about to go into, you know, we're talking about stuff that you've dealt with. Guess what? I'm approaching it. I'm about to breed emeralds for the first time this year. And I'm sure I'm going to have a story behind it, good or bad. I'm going to have some something. Oh, I have something to say, but <laughs> who knows? Uh, this is, but this is why I'm happy to have people like you on the show. Like I, I solely designed and came up with this podcast for my own selfish being. And now I'm, I'm understanding how much people are getting off of it, and I'm glad. But really, Steve, it's about me and the animals. That's all I give a shit about. I just want to continue this legacy um, and to hear somebody like yourself who's – you know, you've been on the same tip. Yeah, you got your you got your passion with the cars. You know, you got your passion with being a charge. Uh, you know, 
being the lead front of tapcat.com, but you, you also love animals. Animals are very important to you. Um, and I, I feel like that's one thing we have in common, my man, for sure. All right. Now, listen, we have hot seat questions. You're not just out of it yet. Um, <laughs> hot seat questions. I need you to answer these as quickly as possible, Steve. That's the way these work. Are you ready for these hot seat questions? I think so. Okay, here we go. Hot seat questions coming in hot for Steve Bolts. Here we go, Steve. You ready? Frozen thought or live? Frozen thought. Would you ever cut a clutch or would you never cut a clutch? Uh, I don't have anything that lays eggs. Well, okay, let's just theoretically say you did. Like, let's just say you did. All right? Would you ever consider cl cutting a clutch if it came down to it? Or would you never cut a clutch? Never. Favorite emerald tree neo, meaning red neo or green neo when it comes to emeralds? Um, red. pre first shed meal or post first shed meal? Post. Red Chondro Neo or Yellow Chondro Neo, if you were to pick? Red. Yay Imports or Boo Imports? Uh, boo Imports. <laughs> okay. One import you would import to your collection, no matter what it is, regardless of your room size, no matter what the animal is, what would you import to your collection right now if you could? Um, a Black Basin. What about one reptile nobody should ever import ever again? Leave it alone. Um, green anacondas. I like that. To miss a basin or to not miss a basin, meaning spray. Yeah. Uh, missed, you know, selectively. Yay sports or boo sports? Uh, yay. Favorite sport? Football. Favorite football team? Don't say the Chiefs. Please don't say the Chiefs. Broncos. Oh, I'm a Raider fan. That's even worse. Oh, my yeah. God. Broncos. Dude, Broncos are terrible. I'm sorry. I'm a Raider fan. Bro Chiefs and Broncos, Chargers, all that. My enemy. But you're not. I'm going to put it on the side for you right now. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll take it back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about this, Steve? Got an important one for you. Big flexor or no flexor? <laughs> come on, come on, Steve. Are you a big flexor or are you a no flexor? Uh, I don't <laughs> think I, I I don't I don't understand the question. <laughs> Okay, how about this? I'll put it in a, a better term. Do you like to show off from time to time, or do you are you just not a show off at all? How about that? Oh, yeah, no, I'm I'm subtle. You're what? I'm, I'm subtle. You're subtle. Okay, okay, respect. Okay, steak or fish? Steak. Favorite cut of steak? Um, T-bone. Okay. Van Halen or Sammy Hagar? Van Halen. Yes, Steve. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, here we go. We're almost done. Little word association. First thing to come to mind. Day 160. Uh, still looks good. Milk. Uh, lactose intolerant. Substrate. Uh, pads. Stuck shed. Rain chamber. Instagram trolls, which you have no idea about because you don't have Instagram, do you? No. Okay, how about this? Facebook trolls. Uh, block them. 
it came down to one platform and one platform only, and I'm curious because you only have one of these, but if you had to get rid of Facebook or if you had to get rid of Instagram at this point in life, which one would have to go, Steve? Facebook or Instagram? Instagram. Steve, you know I mean? you really messed this whole episode up by saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. No, you did it. Steve, dude, what an amazing time. I appreciate you. Two hours and 35 minutes went by very fast. If I had it up to me, I would keep you up for another two and a half hours, but I'm not. I know this will be an amazing round two, but we had, we had up to 90 people tapping in at one point for this episode. What do you have to say to everyone watching this tonight? Everyone inspired, everyone excited to hear from you. What do you have to say to them? Oh, um, I appreciate you, uh, your time, and I hope you got something out of it, enjoyed it. And uh, I mean, uh, MJ, it was fun doing this with you. And thank you. How did I do on the cursing on the cursing test? Did I pass? I think you did uh, reasonably well compared to some of your other <laughs> questions. Hey, listen. This makes me want to be more kid friendly. Maybe I should. Maybe I should try to change the other. You know, change the other. The, the other page. You know, just. You know, maybe I'm not trying to say never say an f bomb, but just keep them. Keep them limited. I don't know. What do you think, Steve? Should I work on that? I. I think. I think you want to develop uh, younger fans. I think you're right. Maybe you're right. I can tell you one thing, man. I want to develop another. Uh, dinner situation with you i would like to hang out with you again someday I, I don't know gary told me that if you if i pass the cursing test on this podcast that i could potentially come visit your place with him is that true or is gary wrong no you're welcome anytime <laughs> there it is gary hey listen steve thank you so much for your time i want to say right now I, I haven't known you too long but from what i know of you and from what i learned on this episode another reason for me to be so excited to be a part of this industry i gotta say thank you so much for your time um and thank you for everything but guys steve volk it's a wrap ladies and gentlemen <laughs> thank you steve have a good night buddy i appreciate thank you. you all right mj i'll see you soon talk to you soon bye-bye wow steve volk in the books ladies and gentlemen did you like that I mean, listen, I did my best. I tried not to cuss, but I'm just a, you know, whatever. I did my best. I think I did good. Steve said I did good. So I know I did good. Steve wouldn't lie. But guys, if you like this episode, if you watched the entire time, hit that like button. Let's get the likes up for Steve Volk. It was an amazing episode. One of many. I'm going to do my best to get this man back on the show because he inspires me, inspires me a lot. It was an amazing episode. And you know why? This is certified by Gary Shavino. Thank you, Gary Shavino. Hit that subscribe button, notification bell. Guys, we have an amazing lineup for the rest of the week. I hope you guys are ready. To, uh, let's see. Sunday night, we have my favorite reptile artist in the game by far. For sure. Adeline Robinson and her husband, Chris. Are they married? I'm pretty sure they're married. But my boy, Chris. It's going down this Sunday night, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. My Patreon members, we have our Zoom session going down immediately after Sunday's podcast. So if you out there want to tap in, the Trap Talk Patreon family, if you want to meet us, if you want to see what it's like, this is your time to join. Go down to the link, click the Trap Talk Patreon family, and tap it in with us Sunday. Trap Talk Zoom session after Adeline Robbins episode. I cannot wait. And then I got to say another amazing podcast going down Monday with my boy Terrence of Keys Constrictors. New breeder on the block series. Let's go. My man's hungry. My man's motivated. My man's been killing it. He's in the podcast game, ball Python game. He's motivating, man. This He ain't playing. And I'm excited to bring him to the platform. We're going to talk about it. So, guys, be ready. It's going to all go down Monday night, 6 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. My Patreon members, I appreciate you guys so much. My trappers, my subscribers, everyone coming down. Give me their time of day watching this, spending their life with me. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. And, again, Gary Shavino, thank you so much for facilitating this episode. Steve Volk, I appreciate you, sir, kind sir. And please. Gary's not the only one who will buy one of your damn basins, and you know that, sir. Come at me. I'm ready for you, Steve. Have a good night, everyone. I'll catch you guys Sunday, and I'm out.